Good morning, everyone. If you don't mind taking your seats. What a fun group again today. We ended December with a great turnout, and again, we have many familiar faces back here again. Happy New Year to everyone. It's 2023. It's the first meeting of our year. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting of January 10th, 2023. It is my distinct honor to start today's meeting with our flag salute led by Supervisor Shanti Landon. So we're going to start out this morning with the ceremonial uh, oath of office for all of our newly elected officials. And I'm going to turn this over to Judge Alan Paneshi. Oh, he's not in the room. Right, so if I can bring you all up front and we will, uh, hmm? yes, up front here. Yes. Ryan, Tristan. Yes. <laughs> so we have quite a large group. Good morning, Andy. Good morning. We're going to actually put hey. you guys right you? in here. Okay. We're going to write this block. We're the lesser of the new one. You guys don't need to do that. This is how we do it. Going over on this side. And then Judge will have you here. I figured we'd be like a little bit the residents. <laughs> oh, do you have the oath? Do you have the oath to give? I have it memorized, but it may be. Oh, you don't. Well. Sure. You're very welcome. Okay. All right. Are you ready? Except for the, uh, except for the part where I say, state your name, repeat after me. And you state your own name. So if you could raise your right hands. I state your name. Do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend. And the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California against all enemies, against all enemies foreign, and foreign and domestic and that I will bear true faith, and, bear true faith and, allegiance and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States and the Constitution of the State of California. In the Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will. And that I will. Well and faithfully. Well and faithfully. Discharge the duties. Discharge the duties. Upon which I'm about to enter. Upon which I'm about to enter. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. 
We so greatly appreciate the hard work you've put in to get to the positions you were just sworn into and the hard work that starts today on this next term of office. So thank you all. I wanted to turn uh, the uh, microphone over to uh, Supervisor Landon who wanted to make a few remarks. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to say a couple things. Over the course of the next four years as I serve in this role, it's really important to me that I remember that I, this is not about me. This is truly about a team effort, and I think, I hope, uh, all of us up here are here because we want to serve Placer County and we want to make it an even better place and leave it a better place for our kids and our grandkids. And so as we move forward and we face challenges and uh, dynamics and disagreements up here, which I'm sure we will have, um, I just wanted to give each of you a um, just a little gift, something you can open later to hopefully just remind you and remind all of us that we are all on Team Placer and we're all here to work to better our community. And that's it. So I'm just going to pass these out while you do your thing. Oops. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shanti. Thank you. Wonderful, Shanti. Nice. Supervisor Gore, did you want to make any comments? First of all, it is wonderful to see so many people out um, in the audience who have um, supported people who um, run for office and who serve in office. And so thank you all for your commitment to our county. And I, I just want to say I'm so pleased to have an opportunity to serve the residents of, of Roseville and Placer County for another four years. Uh, the last four years have been a challenging four years, but Placer County um, has so much opportunity. Uh, we have so many exciting projects, um, a lot of good things happening and, and challenges as well. Um, but as Supervisor Landon said, um, we've got a group of people who work really hard together. We also work with our other elected officials, the local jurisdictions, our community partners, and our residents. And this is truly one of the best places to live in the state of California. And I look forward to continuing to work with my colleagues um, and all of you to really address the challenging things and to continue to do some really good things um, to benefit our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, any other board members want to make a comment? Okay. Not seeing any. Then um, I just, before we move to the next item, I just uh, wanted to make some concluding remarks as chair for this past year, 2022. Such a year, and we've had a number of those uh, through the pandemic, through fires and floods and winter storms and transition in staff. And on behalf of the board, I wanted to thank all of, especially the county staff and our elected officials for the incredible uh, efforts they put in this last year during a very challenging time of transitioning staff. And uh, it wasn't easy. It took a lot of patience and time on, and wisdom from all of you to lead us to the decisions we made in moving forward as your Board of Supervisors. So thank you to our staff, especially our electeds. You were all standing for office in the midst of a lot of controversy. And uh, so thankful that um, we prevailed the way we did in all of those elections and uh, support our staff here in the office who did so much work to keep things moving forward despite shortages of staff and support here at the, at the, at the county. Um, one other item I forgot to mention early on, yesterday was National Law Enforcement Appreciation Day. And since we have uh, Under Sheriff right here, and we wanted to just make a comment and recognize our law enforcement professionals uh, throughout our county who keep us all safe and sound through these days. So thank you very much. We appreciate you greatly. And with that, our second item on our agenda today is the selection of officers. And we will now, uh, I will entertain motions on the selection of a 2023 chair. Supervisor Gore. Madam Chair, I would like to make a motion to elect Supervisor Holmes as our next chair and Supervisor Jones as our next vice chair. Um, Supervisor Holmes has served the county now for 18 years going into his 19th year and I look forward to having him uh, work with us as we um, lead together as a board. Thank you. 
So we have a motion. Do I have a second? I'll second. <laughs> okay, is there any public comment on this item? I'm not seeing any, so with that, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. With that, Supervisor Chairman Holmes. and thank you so much for your leadership this past year. As you said, there has been challenges, um, not only among uh, all the districts, uh, but we really um, honor you for your service and the way you handle it. So congratulations for your thank you. chairmanship. Thank, thank you. Before we begin, first of all, as I look to my left and to my right, we've entered a new era in Placer County governance. And I wanted to pay homage to some trailblazers that, there they are, <coughs> that are the trailblazers who were the women that came on the Board of Supervisors. The first there is Terry Cook, who served three terms. Uh, <clears throat> she was the only woman on the board. Uh, with Alex Ferreira and Robert Mahan. They got a lot of things done back in those days. Uh, Terry is important to me because she appointed me, and I worked with her, to form Sorry City, the uh, North Auburn uh, <laughs> Municipal Advisory Council, and she appointed me to that. Uh, it was interesting, she served three terms, and the third term when she ran, it was the wisdom of the board to have a countywide election for all the supervisors. And the interesting thing was Larry Sevenson was on a ballot as well. And Larry won his district, but he lost in the county. So he lost the election. <coughs> Supervisor <coughs> Cook did the opposite. She, she lost her district, but she won the county. And so uh, very wisely, they decided not to do that anymore. <laughs> But she's still with us. She lives about a quarter of a mile from here, and I keep in touch with her all the time. Um, the next is Harriet White, who actually defeated a sitting supervisor. Uh, and she uh, was a mentor to me, uh, supported me uh, when I decided to run for the Board of Supervisors, uh, served two terms, and wisely decided to step down and then uh, endorse me to take her seat, which I've been happy to do. And then, of course, Jennifer Montgomery, uh, who served two and a half terms. Uh, uh, she resigned to go to work for the state of California. But all those three ladies were formidable. They held their own. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to pay homage to them uh, because you see where we've, go where we've gone from, from there. So welcome, everybody. Welcome, Shanti. And uh, I look forward to leading this board uh, and trying to behave myself as best I can. So. <laughs> So thank you. Now we'll move to item 11A, 11A, a which is a supplemental agenda item, ratifying a proclamation of local emergency in Placer County due to the 2022-23 early winter storms. Who is presenting? Oh, we got him. Oh. You're and I'm going to turn it over to uh, our county executive office officer to give the Great. Entry. Thank you, Chair Holmes. Um, and thanks, everyone, for being here today, most especially those who staffed our EOC through these recent days of winter storms. Um, before they begin, I just want to give, again, um, real kudos to uh, the seamless leadership among PCSO, Placer County Fire, Cal Fire, and our EOC staff for uh, guiding us through these last few wintry days. The focus has been on communications, 
with internal and external uh, customers forecasting and preparing so that we are ahead of these issues as they continue to come down the pike. I think the headline in the B today was six down, three more to go in terms of winter storms, so we're not out of it yet. Um, and certainly appreciate all of the work together, the sharing of information, the collaboration, the problem solving, and the number of resources that all of you, um, in particular PCSO and Placer County Fire, have dedicated to keeping our communities safe through these blustery days. So thank you. Thank you. Who wants to lead? <clears throat> okay, Dave. Good morning, Chair, members of the board. Dave Atkinson, your Assistant Director of Emergency Services. We are here this morning to seek your board's ratification of the proclamation of the existence of a local emergency in Placer County due to the impacts of the series of winter storms that started on December 26, 2022, and are ongoing. Before we start our presentation, I'd like to thank the Clerk of the Board and County Council for their assistance in getting this item before your board today. It is just one of the many examples of the uh, impacts that these disasters have in terms of all of the different disruptions that occur uh, in many of the things going on in the county. I have with me today Placer County Fire Marshal Ryan Wessner and Placer County Sheriff's Office Sergeant Ty Connors, who will provide your board with a brief synopsis of the county's public safety response over these last several days. And we'll start with Fire Marshal Wesner. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair Holmes. And members of the board, my name is Ryan Wesner, Fire Marshal of Placer County. Well, it's been a pretty busy start for uh, 2023. Uh, we had nine days of activation, and um, during that time, well, ending with this morning at the 345 wake up call from that thunderstorm that we got. Um, all the public services have definitely leaned into this. We weren't on our heels, we were prepared for it, and we were in constant communication. And with that, I'd like to thank the board for supporting the integration of Placer County Fire into the OES office. Together, we will establish and maintain a common operating picture that supports response agencies coordination. And for an example, we had um, Ofer Road had a mudslide and CHP shut it down. County Roads went to, uh, went to it as a first responder and came up with a plan, kind of thinking outside the box. They called the OES and with me in the OES office, I made a couple phone calls to the local fire stations. We came up with a plan and instead of having an indefinite date of opening the road, we had the road open within a, one day. So using that as an example for us cooperating and collaborating in OES should help and will help the communities of Placer County. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to my esteemed colleague, Sergeant Ty Connors. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, congratulations, uh, Chair Holmes and Supervisor Landon. And all those elected officials just took their oath. Uh, congr congratulations to all of you. Uh, again, my name is Sergeant Ty Connors with the Placer County Sheriff's Office. I'm currently assigned to assist Dave and Ryan in the EOC during this time. Um, just to kind of real quick give you some numbers, uh, kind of what we handled over the last few uh, rainstorms. Uh, we had a total call for service through the Sheriff's Office. We handled over 1,016 calls. Uh, 291 of those were actually weather-related uh, calls for service uh, during all the storms. Um, obviously, New Year's Eve, that was uh, kind of one of the big ones. Um, Happy New Year. Uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, with that, we actually had nine callouts with our dive team and with CAL FIRE's TRT team um, with basically flooded uh, roads where cars were driving into the flooded areas. And one of the rescues was two adults and one four-year-old child were stranded in a car, and they got rescued by the TRT and the Placer County Sheriff's dive team. Um, so a good collaborative effort with everybody um, coming up with a good solution and obviously a safe solution for those that were stranded. Um, when it came down into the other, uh, obviously the debris flow in our uh, burn scar areas were high concerns when it came to the rainfall that was projected. On the 5th, we actually did an Everbridge um, notification to those areas in the Mosquito Fire and we contacted over 2,174 uh, people just to notify them to stay out of that burn scar and on the river fire with Colfax we're still dealing with that as well when it comes to being a concern uh, we notified over 1,452 
Um, with that being said, uh, we did pre-plan as far as like Ryan was talking about with the collaborative, collaborative effort between the OES office, the sheriff's office, and CAL FIRE. Uh, we are really coming up with a good plan of how we uh, battle each one of these storms as they come in. Um, and again, more is coming, and we are, every day we're getting prepared better. Uh, yesterday we actually had our dive team dedicated uh, to, because of the projection and the, we wanted a quicker response. Uh, they pre-positioned their equipment down the South Placer Jail, which most of the flooding and rescues were occurring down in the lower part of the county. And we had a dive team dedicated to the event yesterday until it was deemed safe to where we, didn't, we can release them. So if you have any questions, that's all I have and to my report. Any questions? <clears throat> I see none. We, we have a little bit more. Pardon? We have a little bit more. Oh, I know that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no questions. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, this has truly been a countywide event on the east side. We had flooding in Soda Springs Road uh, on the Nevada County side, but of course that impacts our residents in Serene Lakes, and that prompted PCSO to issue a plaster alert notification to those folks. Uh, we also had Creek and River flooding in the Truckee River, and then Blackwood and Ward Creeks. Uh, of course, avalanche concerns uh, that prompted Olympic Valley to prompt some local messaging to their folks. And over the course of the New Year's Eve storm, we had about 4,000 people without power that were in the Liberty Utility Service area. Moving west, uh, of course, Public Works, in addition to plowing roads, uh, was incredibly busy responding to calls for service. Some of the more notable ones included some uh, constant plugging of culvert culverts in Michigan Bluff. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, with all of the vegetation gone because of the burn uh, for the mosquito fire, uh, we're getting a lot more debris through the culverts, which they're really just designed to pass water and not water and stuff. Um, and then we did ultimately have a washout in Gorman Ranch Road, and that road is closed and probably will be for some time until uh, we can effect repairs. Uh, you already heard about the Ofer Road landslide. Uh, and then, of course, if you have uh, seen some of the posts from the Forest Service, there's been some significant erosion and undermining of Mosquito Ridge Road and that road is also going to be impassable for a considerable amount of time. Placer County Water Agency, of course, still has the Middle Fork project in the burn scar, and so uh, they had some continued concerns about staff uh, working down in that area, and uh, we worked closely with them to make sure that there were plans in place uh, should they need any support. Flood Control was actively monitoring Miners Ravine, which did reach action stage during the New Year's Eve, and that also prompted a plaster alert message to residents who are in an area that historically floods. And then of course, as, and again, as we all heard this morning, uh, early morning, those high winds and heavy rains have brought down numerous trees and power lines. And we got a report this morning that we have about 5,000 folks without power in Placer County due to that, just that last burst of, uh, of wind and rain. Of course, the response includes public information because that's vital. Steps that we've taken include activating our Joint Information Center to strengthen PIO collaboration between Placer County Fire, the Sheriff's Office, and the County. We activated our Placer 211 surge, uh, which allows them to take calls and help alleviate the non-emergency calls for service to our 911 centers, and it also provides an opportunity for those folks who need some additional assistance uh, to seek that out and to get some some help with that. We responded to numerous media requests, and of course we've been making extensive use of our Ready Placer dashboard that includes information about not only road closures, sandbag locations, the areas and the burn scars that we recommend people avoid during these types of events, and a lot, a whole lot of other information. I also wanted to update your board that uh, since the staff report was written, uh, Placer County has been included as one of 17 counties in a federal emergency declaration issued by the president yesterday morning. This declaration included the possibility of reimbursement for what are called emergency protective measures taken by public agencies. To advocate for additional benefits, Placer IT developed a private property damage assessment survey which we have issued to the public. And so far we've gotten 100 entries and I would just like to encourage anyone who happens to be listening and, and also ask for your board's help in just getting the word out on that, that's how we're going to be able to collect data to advocate for our communities on their behalf to bring additional assistance from the state and federal government. 
while the New Year's Eve storm has been the most impactful so far as both uh, the fire marshal and, and the sergeant mentioned, uh, we're not out of the woods yet and we have a few more storms that we're aware of lined up and we will continue to lean forward and make sure that we're prepared for those. That concludes our presentation to you this morning. Um, again, the action before your board is to adopt a resolution to ratify a proclamation of local emergency in Placer County due to the 2022-2023 early winter storms. And we have the entire ESC management team here this morning to answer any questions that you have, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, did you have a question you had your light on? <clears throat> no. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, let me just thank all the public safety officials that really worked tirelessly during these last several days. I also want to shout out to Public Works. Uh, they've been out and about uh, clearing roads, cutting trees, uh, working really, really hard uh, through the middle of the night sometimes, but they've really done a great job. I also want to thank the uh, uh, probation department who helped with some of our unhoused population out in North Auburn. They opened up a building, had coffee, a warming place, uh, soup available for them so they can get out of the, uh, the elements uh, particularly when the wind was blowing really, uh, really bad. So I think they were there for three days, something? yeah, three days uh, <clears throat> uh, constantly, making sure that that unhoused population was safe. So I want to just thank them as well. Uh, <clears throat> Supervisor Gustafson, did you have a comment? I did. I had a question <clears throat> and a comment, and you, and you did a great job thanking everybody. Um, the other group is our facilities department who somehow kept <clears throat> this building operational today, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of fans around if you haven't looked, um, and I mean the motorized fans, not <laughs> on that. Um, Dave, I had a question. Um, thank you for bringing this proclamation forward. We need to be prepared uh, for the damages, um, but we also at the same time have the mosquito fire um, that it came through from the state that we will have assistance there. I was in Forest Hill last night and there was a lot of concern from property owners. I think almost 20 have had damage to their private properties from erosion from public properties. And I'm not sure which, they should go ahead and fill out this damage assessment, is that correct? Absolutely. And it may be attributable to mosquito fire funding or it may be attributable to this funding but OES will work that out and correct. make sure they're they're reimbursed or or their assessments are put in correct I would I would ask them to do two things one definitely fill out the online survey and then the second is if they have not already done so they need to complete the the process for signing up for the consolidated debris removal program uh, we had hoped to be underway actually already clearing debris but the weather uh, got a big vote in that and we were delayed until things um, improve weather wise so there's a little bit more time for folks to sign up so in order for them to be eligible for any kind of cleanup if we can make that tie back to the mosquito fire they must sign up for the consolidated debris removal program and there's extensive information that environmental health has posted on how to do that on our fire recovery page uh, on the county website and if folks uh, need any assistance they can they can contact OES at 530-886-5300, and we'd be happy to get them connected up with the right folks. Great, well, I know that uh, some of the uh, individuals had cleared their properties. It was our county culverts and drainage that became clogged, and they've been doing, DPW's been doing a great job trying to get those cleared, but hasn't been able to clear them all right. uh, because of the nature of some of the debris that has washed in. So uh, just making sure that the county's processing that, but also then the impacts as it overflows and yes. creates erosion in their properties. So. Yes, and, and this is one of the challenges dealing with the state and the federal government and yeah. how they have set up their disaster recovery programs in terms of looking at these as you know separate incidents when really it, it, it all goes back to the fire, really. Yeah. So, um, but uh, that's, Brandy's becoming a subject matter expert uh, as we've stacked up these recoveries and we will we will work our way through that. So, yeah, it's but, been yeah. a busy couple of years. Well, thanks again. I appreciate and I think Supervisor Holmes uh, articulated all of our support for fire, Placer Fire and our Sheriff's Office being embedded with OES and making sure that communication is seamless. I really appreciate that. Any other comments from board members? Seeing none, uh, oh. Did you have an answer? No, nope, nope, I was just going to. Yeah, you've got to be careful with that light. All right. Uh, is there any public comment for off this item? I see none. No one online? Uh, all right. I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the resolution. 
I'll second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the ratify our proclamation. A ratify our proclamation, thank you. A local emergency in Placer County due to the 2022-23 early winter storms. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any objections? Thank you. The item is moved. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for your support. Yeah, thank you. Now we'll move to the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda have been recommended for approval by the county executive department. The board will, will convene as the successor agency for items 27A and 27B. All items will be approved by a single roll call vote. Anyone may ask to address consent items prior to the board taking action and the item may be removed for discussion. Any items on consent that any board member wants to take off? I hear none. Anybody in the public want to say, have an item that they want off the consent? Hello, Richard. Good morning, board and uh, new chairman Holmes. Yes. My name is Richard Ling and Joe. Um, There's no comment. Unlike uh, agenda. Uh, Richard, is this public comment or no. is this an item? He wants to pull an item. Okay. Oh, you yes. want to pull an item. Okay. He does. Uh, unlike uh, agenda item number 25B, Thorium Electric rejects direct government funding. EV charging and biomass. We'll take, Richard, you'll have to wait until we take any other items that, and then we're going to approve the remaining items and then we'll, uh, we'll address your item. Sorry. So, so I should sit down? Just have a seat for a second. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Is there any other uh, public uh, consent items that need to be pulled from the agenda? Chair, we're we are going to also remove item 17A, and this one's going to be pulled from the agenda to be brought back at a future date. Okay, so item 17A will be pulled from the agenda and brought back at a, a, a later date. Okay, all right. Seeing none now, you can come forward. And oh, wait a minute, let me finish. <laughs> I'm kind of new to this. Uh, we need to approve the remaining items on the consent calendar move approval. I'll second. it's been moved and seconded to move the remaining items on the consent calendar all of those in favor it's a roll call, it's a roll call vote yeah you wrote it down here for me <laughs> gore aye. landon aye. yes jones aye gustafson aye. holmes yes thank you now we'll move to item 25b Kevin Bell is here as well as oh, okay presentation. oh Kevin Bell is going to give us a presentation. Yeah, and then. Good morning, Chairman Holmes, and welcome, Supervisor Landon. Um, I'm filling in for Jared this morning, and the item before you is the uh, authorize the chair or the county executive officer or designee to sign a consultant services agreement with Energy Analytics for Middle Fork Project Hydroelectric Energy Consulting in an amount not to exceed $100,000. <clears> and two, to determine that the proposed action is not a project pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act guidelines, section 1537B, 378B5. Uh, so as you know, Placer County has a partnership with Placer County Water Agency for the Middle Fork Project, which is a series of reservoirs and hydroelectric generation uh, facilities. Uh, we, we, working with PCWA, market the electricity that's generated from those reservoirs, and layer, the, the contract that you have before you is to help us, assist us and PCWA in determining how those energy sales should be made. You can contract long term and lock in a price for a very long period of time, or you can go to a daily market. And so creating a balance of, of some long term sales and some shorter term sales helps us maximize the revenues that we can realize and minimize risk uh, from the sale of that electricity. And so this contract before you is for uh, Laird Dyer or Energy Analytics um, to assist us in evaluating policies and, and when and how we should be making those sales. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions or step aside. Any questions? I have no questions. Anybody on the board have questions? Okay. Thank you. We'll now 
Now, Richard, come forward, please. Thank you. Uh, I apologize for my ignorance of the procedures. No problem. Um, unlike uh, Agenda 25B proposal, Thorium Electric rejects any direct government funding. EV charging, biomass, uh, this project are all on the agenda regarding electrical power. Uh, the Middle Fork uh, River Electrical Project uh, will be uh, not as reliable as the project I want to build in the process of planning and uh, could potentially create additional damage to the river environment. Uh, I uh, alerted uh, the board uh, to the uh, electrical grid deficiencies in June of 22 in a, uh, in a note that uh, I made available to the board. Uh, my thorium electric plan I submitted in writing on July 22 in a, ha in a handout form. Um, what I propose is new safe, clean, electrical power. Uh, I have a handout here. If I could ask the clerk to please pass out to the board. And uh, what I would like to do is uh, have the board place on the agenda uh, a time when I could make a, a detailed presentation to the board about what I'm proposing. Since the board's involved in other electrical projects, I wouldn't see why that you wouldn't listen to my, my potential project. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any questions, <clears throat> board members? Okay. No questions. <clears throat> Already. Seeing no more public comment, I'll entertain a motion to approve the item. Oh, this is this is not. No, it's next. <clears throat> Work with me, okay? <laughs> it's moved and seconded to move the item uh, 25B. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? The item is moved. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Richard. <clears throat> now we'll move to public comment. Persons may address the board on items not on this agenda. Please limit comments to three minutes per person since the time allotted for public comment is 15 minutes. If all comments, comments cannot be heard within the 15 minute time limit, the public comment period will be taken up at the end of the regular session. The board is not per permitted to take any action on items addressed under public comment. You may begin. <clears throat> Thank you, Jennifer White, Pastor County. Sorry about me being confused earlier. Um, welcome, Ms. Landon and um, I just have some updates for the United States this time instead of just worldwide stuff. Um, we've been noticing more athletes um, passing out or having heart attacks or dying um, here in the States now. It's been happening over in Europe in the soccer clubs or the football clubs for some time. Um, and, and I think we need to kind of look at a lot of these athletes have been forced to have been vaccinated um, they don't get put on these teams if they're in poor health ahead of time. I've seen a lot of statistics as well showing we've had as many people die in the last two years or have heart issues of these professional athletes as in the last 30 years. I can't confirm those 100%, but it seems 
to be quite possible. Um, I think something we need to also be aware of is in Washington State, a young boy who was just born, um, just, I don't know exactly when he was born, but in December he had a congenital heart defect. The hospital allowed unvaccinated blood to come in for his surgery. They lost it prior to the morning of the surgery. Um, then the hospital used the vaccinated blood. The next day the boy had blood clots and died. So um, again, I don't know if we are really aware or have enough studies or any long-term studies on blood transfusions of vaccinated blood going to unvaccinated people or even, vaccin or even vaccinated people because I don't know if there's an issue with the vaccines being mixed as they go into your blood because we don't know which vaccines are in the blood necessarily when it's being transfused. So I really hope Placer County will consider creating an unvaccinated blood bank that will work with hospitals in our area or even into the Sacramento region because I think this is something that's gonna really start coming up um, more and more over the next couple years as we're seeing more and more um, health issues coming up with the general public who have been vaccinated or boosted. Um, we have different vaccines than Europe, so we didn't get the AstraZeneca vaccine, which seems to have really created a lot of issues where in Australia they're actually putting defibrillators all over the country because so many people are having heart issues there. Um, so I, I really hope we can um, consider this unvaccinated blood bank for Placer County um, and also being conscientious about recommending this vaccine that does not stop the spread of COVID. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> morning. Good morning, Chair, fellow members, staff. I'm Charles Merkley. I'm the Director of Sales and Municipal Contracts for FCC Environmental Services. Uh, we've been now in the, uh, the authority working there since July and very excited to be a partner now in the county and doing that work and also I'd like to tell you today is just to introduce our company we uh, really want to get ingrained in Placer County and all the communities that are serving in this county uh, we've had our challenges with the recent storms at, over at the authority but uh, we're still there and kicking and we appreciate working with the authority so much because it's a, it's a true partnership one of the things I'd like to also tell you today, besides doing post collections, we also service over 10 million Americans uh, curbside collections. So we're excited to be a partner in the county and all the communities look forward to possibilities and anything that may come our way in the services we provide. Congratulations, Chair, new Chairman Langdon. And we're excited to be in your community and wanted you to see a face and what our company provides. So thank you. Thank you. Can you give me the name of your company again? FCC Environmental Services. So we, we I'm going to try to say this properly, WAPA. WAPA. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. So we run that facility now. Yeah. We took it over in July. I see that. And uh, we're really looking forward to doing the upgrades, uh, obviously. That will be a, an amazing facility when we get all of our new equipment in there and everything uh, that we hope and to achieve. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Is there any more public comment? Please come forward. Oh, Mark. Good morning, board. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share today. Uh, for the record, my name is Mark Griffin. I'm the Director of Customer Service with Pioneer Community Energy, and we just wanted to share some 2023 news with the community. Pioneer Community Energy is a locally owned nonprofit electric provider. We power the communities we serve, including most of Placer County, with competitive rates, reliable service, and a choice of energy options. Pioneer has been serving the region for five years, actually having been founded right here in Placer County. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the focus of our board over that time has been saving money for our customers, which has resulted in over $40 million saved by the residents and businesses in the county. Our governing board, which includes Supervisor Jones and now Chair Holmes, recently approved Pioneer's 2023 rates that supports a discount greater than 15% 
when compared to PG&E's generation portion of the bill. This will result in a projected $27 million in savings for Placer County customers and over $46 million savings for all the Pioneer customers in El Dorado and Placer County, and that is just in 2023 alone. <clears throat> Excuse me. A household, an average household in Placer County that uses approximately 650 kbh, which is what an average home uses, will save over $185 per year with Pioneer. As a reminder, we supply the electricity, but the gas, transmission, and distribution are still provided by PG&E. We all know that the high natural gas prices have been driving up our electric and gas bills every month, and so we'd like to share a few ideas that customers and residents and businesses can take on to help save money and lower their bills starting this month. Customers who previously opted out of Pioneer Services may want to consider opting back into Pioneer and start realizing these savings immediately. On top of that, our website offers many low to no cost energy saving tips. Every effort has a lasting effect. Doing simple things such as turning off lights, adjusting your thermostat, or even installing LED light bulbs will start realizing savings today for folks. And then finally, for customers experiencing financial hardship, we have a section on our website dedicated with information that helps educate residents about programs available to them statewide with bill repayment and ways to make their payments with PG&E, Pioneer, and other utilities. For any customer wishing to join Pioneer and realize these savings, along with the other 85% of their neighbors and local businesses, signing up is easy. You can simply do that online on our website, or you can make a phone call to 844-937-7466. Our website is pioneercommunityenergy.org, and that contains a lot of information. And with that, I just want to say thank you and congratulations to Chair. And you all have a wonderful 2023, and we look forward to a long relationship. Uh, thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Any other public comment? Anyone online? We do, sir. Oh, good. Muriel, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Uh, I'm Muriel Davis, and I'm here to ask you, our supervisors, to please open the Penryn Library. This weather and the high gas prices are showing how important it is for our local Penryn and Loomis Basin residents, especially the children, to have a local library. Our Penryn Library has enriched our community for a, a hundred years. Please open it and show that you support our rural community. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel. Okay. Dan, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Dan, can you unmute your mic and give your comments? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, hi. Good, uh, good morning, board members. My name is Dan Watson. And I'm a field rep for the NorCal Carpenters Union Local 1789 in the Lake Tahoe, Truckee area. Uh, with all the building and development going on in the area, I'd like to take to talk, take a minute to talk about the core values of the Carpenters Union and how they affect our community. The core values of the Carpenters Union are apprenticeship, healthcare, and local hire. Speaking as someone who went through the Carpenters Apprenticeship Program, it was a great experience for me. It allowed me to get the training I needed while working and earning a living wage. Not everyone can afford to go to college and honestly, nor do they want to go. Some people like to work hard with their hands like me and these people um, are needed to build and maintain our infrastructure and community. Apprenticeship programs are important for these people and provide education, training, security and stability they need to feed and support themselves and their families. Um, the next is healthcare. We all know the importance of having healthcare Everyone who works full time should have good affordable health should have a good affordable health care plan to take care of themselves and their families. If the workforce cannot take care of their their health, how can they help build our infrastructure and communities we live in? The third is local hire. The people who live in our community should be the ones building in our community. People should not have to sit in traffic for two hours each direction to go to work. We need to do a better job in creating these opportunities for members in our community. 
If we have public projects being awarded to companies who have no local affiliations and no way to efficiently hire locally, what does that do to help the members of our community? Why not get the most out of our taxpayer dollars by building projects with properly trained local people who can use their paychecks to feed their families who live in our community? I think it's important to look at the whole picture of the projects we build, not just the type of project or where it's going to be or who's going to use it or what it is for. It's important to also think about the construction jobs these projects create and who is going to be building them. Let's get the most out of our taxpayer dollars by not only building these projects, but building them with properly trained local people. As the leaders of our community, it is our responsibility to create and maintain these good paying jobs with benefits for local people in our community by supporting contractors who support these values on all their projects all the time. I look forward to working with you all and all the and with all the developers and contractors in the area to help create good jobs that pay a living wage and benefits for the members of our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Is there any other? There is more. Beth, please unmute your mic and give your comments. Um, hello, good morning, everyone. Congratulations to the uh, Philandi, especially Ashanti. Um, I am here talking about the unhoused people that uh, Mr. Holmes made a nod to in his opening statement, and I appreciate your um, expression of that. There, I have nine points um, quickly. There are many unhoused people in Placer County. It is the responsibility of the elected officials of Placer County to house people. There is land in Placer County. There is funding available. There are solutions available to solve the issue of the unhoused. There are professional personnel who can carry out these solutions. There is no more time for studies. Now it's your turn, members of the board, to make decisions to begin housing the unhoused. Please take this opportunity. It's in front of you. Um, I know that you know about it and i offer you courage to make bold decisions thank you thank you beth one more one more sandy go ahead and unmute your mic and give your comments good morning everyone this is sandy from placer county and i just wanted to thank you guys for having uh, the zoom available because um I was uh, planning on being there in person to um, witness the wonderful oath that you all took um, this morning and uh, I witnessed it on Zoom, so that was great. I wanted to congratulate everyone on, um, on all the hard work that, they, uh, that it took for them to get into that position. Um, I wanna wish you luck in this new year and uh, just, uh, I had some um, pocket constitutions that I wanted to deliver to you all, uh, just to have, um, to refer to, because you know our constitution is so important and I'm just so proud of all of you taking that oath to defend it, uh, both the, uh, the United States constitution and the California constitution. So thank you for doing that. And, um, I'll be getting those little pocket constitutions to you guys and, um, yeah, congratulations again and happy new year. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Chair, I see no further comments. No more further, further comments. Thank you. We will close public comment. And since we do have five minutes before our next timed item, Pardon? Board executive reports. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Now it's the time for uh, any board member reports. Supervisor Gore. Thank you, Chair Holmes. Uh, no report out, but I did want to say a welcome to Supervisor Landon. I don't think we had a chance to do that yet. And I am pleased to have you um, here serving with us. And I look forward uh, to the next four years as you serve uh, the residents of District 2 and Placer County. So welcome. Oh, thank you. Suzanne. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to start off the new year by telling all my constituents and, and, and the constituents actually and the county staff as well, thank you so much for all of your support and over, the, over the last year. 
and I want to extend my warmest wishes for a happy new year, happy, healthy, and prosperous for all of you, and especially all of my constituents and all of my co-board members and staff. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Supervisor Jones. Supervisor Gustafson. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to report to the board the Tahoe Regional Planning Agency that I serve on, uh, on representing uh, all of you, um, has had quite a bit of turnover and found out uh, over the holidays that um, with the new governor's arrival in Nevada that we're going to have at least one, maybe more transitions on the TRPA governing board. So um, the most recent loss is Jim Lawrence, who was head of um, conservation, environmental conservation um, for the state of Nevada, and uh, he's being replaced um, by James Settlemeyer, who is a former uh, senator in the state of Nevada and was interested in the position. So um, we're looking forward to um, working with um, Senator, former Senator uh, Settlemeyer on the TRPA governing board, but we're also um, very aware of the loss that Jim uh, will bring uh, after, uh, gosh, I want to say he's been on the board at least. 10 or 15 years um, in that capacity. So continuing transitions at TRPA, I think we've had three new board members in a year there and a new executive director. So lots lots to come on that. So just wanted to give you that report. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? <clears throat> I want to mention about, the, I have been a member of the Rural County Representatives of California for the last 18 years. And this last year uh, we have, uh, lost 10 members of the RCRC board. Um, many of them have been on, on the board as long as I have. Uh, they decided not to run for re-election. Some members were not, uh, not re-elected. Uh, and so uh, we will be uh, later this week, I'll be down at RCRC board meeting and getting to know some of the new board members coming in from the different counties. There's 30 uh, counties involved in the R Rural County Representatives of California. It's a very effective lobby uh, organization, particularly for the smaller counties, uh, Alpine County, Sierra County, um, Lassen, all of the northern counties that are, uh, have low populations. But it's very important for them to have a voice and uh, by working with RCRC and their staff, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, the ability uh, to meet with uh, state and federal elected officials uh, to ensure that their voices are heard. So uh, I'll be down there for uh, the new, uh, we'll have a new chair from Butte County uh, on uh, Wednesday, and uh, I'll, I'll be glad to be there. But I'll be uh, the senior member of RCRC, as apparently I am with this board. So, <laughs> so thank you. <clears throat> Uh, chair, uh, CEO, no, yep. okay. Earlier. I'm just trying to. <laughs> 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 to <laughs> <laughs> okay, we got uh, about a minute before our our next item, and I didn't want to start the unless they're available. Should should I start the department item, or should we? You can start the department item. Okay, okay, we'll go ahead and start the uh, first department item which is 9A Health and Human Services, Psychiatric, oh, on Zoom, Psychiatric Skilled Nursing Facilities for Mentally Disabled Adults, Amendment with CF Merced Behavioral Center. Uh, um, good, good morning, Chair Holmes, uh, and welcome Supervisor Landon and members of the board. Um, I'm Amy Ellis with the Adult System of Care here today with an action item today to approve an amendment with CF Merced Behavioral LLC doing business as Merced Behavioral Center to provide psychiatric skilled nursing facility services for mentally disabled adults to increase the agreement by $130,000 for a new total amount not to exceed $528,000 for the period of July 1st, 2021 through June 30th, 2023 and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to execu execute the amendment and to sign subsequent amendments not to exceed $52,800 consistent with the subject matter and scope of work with risk management and county council concurrence. So Placer County Adult System of Care is mandated to provide a range of services to those with severe and chronic mental illness 
which includes up to inpatient hospitalization at an institute of mentally disease such as this one. The uh, Merced, Merced Behavioral often accepts complex clients that other facilities decline. And for this reason, we placed more clients with Merced than originally anticipated, necessitating that this contract be amended. Um, Merced has been serving Placer County clients for nearly two decades and continues to provide the care and treatment, which allows most of these clients to eventually discharge to a lower level of care and back to their communities to receive intensive outpatient care here in Placer County. This has been appropriately budgeted within Health and Human Services. The agreement includes $93,654 in county general fund. Um, and the remaining funds is federal and state revenues. However, no additional general fund or federal and state revenues will be needed as a result of this increase, typically due to uh, lower than anticipated utilization in other similar contracts. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Amy. Any questions from board members? Uh, Supervisor Jones. Yes, <clears throat> good morning, Amy. Thank you so much for that report. Um, I have a couple of questions on the background in our in our board docs. It says um, two things that seem a little bit contradictory. It says that there are times when a client requires a structured therapeutic setting in a secure facility. And then it also says that they need a special, some clients need a special step down program that is both secure and therapeutic, which Merced provides. So um, is, which is it a kind of an interim setting before they go to something um, that provides greater services like the psychiatric health facility or is it a the destination for your clients needing that service so the, uh, good question so oftentimes our contracts actually have more than one level of care within them so merced behavioral health does have, they accept our very complex clients that really need that highest level of structured care. Um, but then they also do have some facilities that allow them to step down before they're ready to come all the way back to our community. So I would say the answer is both of those. Uh, but uh, yeah, the contract went over mostly for that very highest complex IMD level of care that we had to place some individuals with, um, at their facility this year. Well, great. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm happy that they're there to provide those services for us. Mm -hmm. any, any other board comments? Jane, go for it. Thank you, Chair. Less of a comment and more of a kudos. Seeing Amy's face, we were remiss in not also acknowledging our HHS team for the services they coordinated on behalf of our unhoused population over yeah. the weekend. So great thanks to you, Amy, to Dr. Oldham, and to Deputy CEO Becky Riggin for your tireless work over the weekend. Thank you. Thank you, and thanks for your leadership with that, Jane. Any public comment on this item? Any online? I see none. The chair will entertain a motion. I'll move approval of the item. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none. Now we'll move to our 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. Treasurer Tax Collector timed item. A issuance and sale of special tax bonds for Riola Vineyard specific plan facilities, County of Placer Community Facilities District number 2017-1, improvement area number two. Good morning, Chair, Honorable Board, Tristan Butcher, Treasurer Tax Collector of Placer County. Uh, today, uh, we're bringing forward an item for you, uh, a resolution authorizing the issuance of uh, issuance and sale of special tax bonds for the purpose of financing authorized facilities and improving and authorizing related documents and actions uh, for improvement area two of the County of Placer Community Facilities District number 2017-1 Riolo Vineyard specific plan. On Zoom today, we have uh, Chris Lynch from Jones Hall. He is the county's bond council, Ken Deeker, uh, from Del Rio Advisors. He is the uh, municipal advisor and Eric McKeon from Ramirez and Company and he's the county's underwriter on this deal. Um, to give you a little bit of background, the Board of Supervisors previously conducted proceedings to form the County of Placer Community Facilities District number 2017-1 Rio Vineyard specific plan and improvement area one 
and provided for a future annexation area for the CFD. Uh, as you might remember, back in uh, December of 2021, uh, the county issued bonds for improvement area one in an amount of $10.89 million. Um, and today we are here for improvement area number two. Uh, Pursuant to resolution number 2021-281 adopted by the Board of Supervisors back on August 10th, 2021, the Board of Supervisors acknowledged receipt of the unanim unanimous approval executed by Gen 8 California, which is the property owner of assessor's parcel number 023-221-005, who was annexing their property into the CFD area as improvement area number two. Uh, today, we are uh, uh, part of the resolution is approval of the, um, uh, sorry, lost my place. Uh, the issuance of. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and special tax bonds. Exactly. Uh, Ms., uh, on the resolution, more specifically, uh, the authorization of the issuance of bonds in amount not to exceed $5.25 million with a true interest cost not to exceed 6.75%. Also, authorizing and director, directing the authorized officers uh, to take necessary actions to deliver the 2023 bonds and receive the purchase price of the 2023 bonds. The authorized officers is the county executive officer, uh, the treasurer tax collector, and the auditor controller or their designees. Also, we're authorizing and directing the authorized author, auth officers to take the necessary uh, actions to execute and deliver the documents related to the issuance of the 2023 bonds, approving the fiscal agent agreement in, in substantially final form and authorizing the execution and the selection of the fiscal agent. The fiscal, fiscal agent agreement designates the Placer County Treasurer Tax Collector as the fis fiscal agent. Uh, we're also approving the preliminary official statement in substantially final form. It's distribution by the underwriter, Samuel A. Ramirez and Company, to prospective purchasers in compliance with the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934 rule. In addition, we're approving the sale of the 2023, pursuant, or 2023 bonds pursuant to the bond purchase agreement with the underwriter in substantially final form. And we're also approving and confirming and ratifying all actions taken by staff and agents of the county in relation to the issuance and sale of the 2023 bonds prior to the adoption of the resolution. In accordance with government code 5852.1, uh, the uh, appendix A of the resolution is a good faith. The estimated aggregate principal amount of the 2023 bonds is 4.68 million excluding a net original issue discount estimated up amount of 69,942,000. ,000. The true interest cost of the 2023 bonds is estimated to be at 6.189%. The finance charge, all fees uh, and charges paid to third parties of the 2023 bonds is estimated to be $331,900. The amount of proceeds to be received by the county as a result of the sale of the 2023 bonds to uh, the underwriter is estimated to be 4.582, uh, I'm sorry, 4.528 million, uh, which staff expects to allocate approximately 3.657, roughly to the project fund uh, to be used to reimburse for facilities on the project that have already been completed. Pursuant to the county's debt disclosure policies and procedures, the debt issuance working group disclosure working group met on January 3rd to review the attached preliminary, preliminary official statement. The group included CEO Jane Christensen, Auditor Andy Sisk, and County Council Karen Schwab, myself, and staff members from all offices. We met, reviewed, and approved to uh, forward the preliminary official statement to the board for approval. Uh, the distribution of the preliminary official statement by the county is subject to federal securities laws. These laws require the preliminary official statement to be included to include all facts that would be material to an investor uh, in the 2023 bonds. Material information is information that there is a substantial likelihood that would have an actual significance in the deliberations of a reasonable investor when deciding whether to buy or sell or hold the 2023 bonds. 
If the County Board of Supervisors concludes that the preliminary official statement includes all facts that would be material to an investor in the 2023 bonds, it must adopt a resolution that authorizes staff to execute a certificate to the effect that the preliminary official statement has been deemed final. The Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, the agency with regulatory authority over the county's compliance with federal securities laws, has issued guidance stating that if a member of the county board of supervisors has knowledge of any facts or circumstances that an investor would want to know about prior to investing in the 2023 bonds, whether relating to the repayment, tax exempt status, undisclosed conflict, conflicts of interest with interested parties or otherwise, he or she should endeavor to discover whether the, such facts are adequately disclosed in the preliminary official statement. The preliminary official statement is prepared by Jones Hall, Juan Galvin, serving as, county, uh, as the county's disclosure counsel for this transaction with assistance of the financing team, including county staff, uh, the county's municipal advisor, the underwriter, the county's special tax consultant, and the landowner developers in improvement area number two. The key sections of the preliminary official statement uh, are summarized as, uh, the 2023 bonds. This section summarizes the key terms of the 2023 bonds, including payment dates and redemption provisions. Uh, there's an additional section for security for the 2023 bonds. This section summarizes key security terms, including the county's pledge of special tax revenues, its covenant to levy special taxes according to the rate and method of apportionment of special taxes for the improvement area number two and its covenant to foreclose on parcels that are delinquent in the payment of special taxes. An additional section is the, the district and improvement area number two. This section summarizes certain features of improvement area number two, including the appraised value of taxable property, overlapping taxes, assessments, and maximum special taxes that may be levied uh, by the county. Property ownership and development status. This, in, this section includes information provided by the developers of the property in improvement area number two, which they will certify as accurate and complete and describe the proposed development in its current status. The property within improvement area number two is proposed and entitled for the development of 170 detached single family residential lots within two subdivisions known as Seasons at Ma Mason Trails and Melrose at Mason Trails. The master developer has conveyed all land within improvement area two that is planned for residential development to Richmond American, who holds 77 parcels, and DR Horton, who uh, holds the other remaining 93. Bond owners, bond owners risk. This section highlights the primary risks associated with the 2023 bonds, including failure to complete proposed development, natural disasters, and failure of property owners to pay their special taxes. Legal matters, uh, tax exemption. This section describes the tax exempt nature of the uh, interest on the 2023 bonds. I wanna note that the county costs for the issuance of the 2023 bonds will be paid with the proceeds of the 2023 bonds and annual administration of the 2023 bonds will be paid with special taxes collected annually from property tax owners. There is no direct cost to the, of the general fund. And with that, we would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, let me just thank you for reading that into the record. We really <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, is there any comments from board members? Seeing none, anybody in the audience have any uh, public comment on this item? And none on Zoom. All right. I think uh, we're asked to adopt a resolution authorizing the issuance and sale of special tax bonds for the purpose of financing authorized facilities and approving and authorizing related documents and actions of Placer Community Facilities District 27, 2017-1. It's been moved and seconded to move the item. This is a roll call vote. Will the clerk please call the roll? Landon? Yes. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Yes. Gore? Aye. Holmes? Aye. The motion is passed. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Is it 10 <laughs> Curveball. <laughs> I don't have the residence now. 
Okay, I think um, we're just a minute shy of, of the 1015 item. Pardon? It's 1015? Okay, now we'll move to uh, item, uh, the 1015 timed item uh, from the county executive. Presentation Valley Vision regarding the Sacramento Regional Community Economic Resilience Fund. Madam CEO, please. Are you ready? We're ready. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman Holmes and, and board. Thank you so much for having us here today. My name is Evan Schmidt. I'm the CEO of Valley Vision, and I'm here to talk to you today about the Community Economic Resilience Fund, otherwise known as SURF across the state. And uh, Alana, if we could go to the next slide. All right, so a little bit about Valley Vision. Valley Vision is a nonprofit organization. We're located in Sacramento, but we're regionally facing um, and have played the role of a regional intermediary and um, collaborator to support social equity, economic prosperity, and environmental sustainability for the last 27 years. And we're really excited about this new, prog uh, this new program of SURF, which really enables us to do what we do best, that is facilitate collaboration, activate research, do some catalytic programming and help our region solve some of our most complex and challenging issues uh, that we face together. Next slide, please. You can also see that we have our surf team here, um, including both Alana and I, Alana Ramsey, um, who's here on the call today as well. So that what is the Community Economic Resilience Fund? This is a state program. It's a use of state general funds that will distribute $600 million to regions across California. And the idea behind SURF is to support inclusive and low carbon economic development. The ideas behind SURF are to do economic development in a little bit of a different way um, than what we've seen in the past. So um, with the, the program objectives are to promote equitable and sustainable economic development, um, a really strong emphasis on inclusive economic planning and equity centered planning, um, as well as prioritizing low carbon economy. So really thinking about how, as a region, are we transitioning to a lower carbon economy and how do we make sure we're doing that in an inclusive way um, as we think about some of our most disinvested communities across our region. And then finally, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the different phasings of the, of the project, but uh, main goal is to align and leverage federal and state funding to maximize economic resilience. So the name of the game is really to bring some investments into our region to support this type of economic development projects. All right, so what is our region? Um, the state has defined uh, 13 regions across California, and you can see in blue here uh, the way they've defined our region. So um, it's an eight county region, and um, it includes, you know, if you think about our region and, and the expanse of it, um, it's a really, a large and diverse region. So we have our urban Sacramento, we have the foot, the Sierra foothills, we have our mountain communities, and we have a lot of agriculture um, throughout these counties. So really thinking about the whole expanse from urban to rural and really everything in between when you're thinking about this eight county region. All right, so talk just a minute about some of the details of the SURF program. Um, there's two different phases to surf. So first is the planning phase, and that's what we're about to embark on. And then next, and, and really importantly, is the implementation phase. And that's where the state really provides some resources to support the priorities that come up through the, through the planning phase. Um, but the planning phase part of surf, um, it gives each region $5 million each to build these regional collaboratives. And I'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like and ultimately to build these regional economic plans. So this is, um, this is a chance to build a collaborative and inclusive vision for regional economic growth across this eight county region. And then when we get to the implementation phase, um, you can see here, and I won't read all the bullets, but really some of the goals that they, that they wanna support through implementation, but the state will have $500 million to help support the priorities from the planning phase um, and, you know, just to note, one of the goals is to leverage the, um, the investments that we can get into the region well beyond the program itself, um, but it is significant that they're offering resources in order to really fund these plans. 
All right, so Valley Vision is serving the role as the regional convener and the fiscal agent for our region. And what that really means is that, is that we applied on behalf of the region to manage the coalition, to manage the program throughout this planning phase, and to fiscally manage the $5 million that's, that's coming in. And so in order to do that, you know, it's this idea of managing a regional coalition um, we propose this governance structure that, um, as you look at this visual, it helps kind of helps helps you see what some of the priorities of the project are and the ways that we're going to launch into this work. So um, we're going to be building a decision making body. That's the leadership council that you see on top. And there's a number of different um, types of entities that we want to make sure are represented within that leadership council. So first, you can see this recognition of our geographic subregions. So really recognizing the diversity across the eight county region and knowing that we're going to make sure to have representation from the Sierra Foothills, the Truckee Tahoe Basin, the Sacramento MSA, Yuba and Sutter and Calusa counties. Um, next, if you look in the middle, you can see some of the types of activities that we're going to be prioritizing as we think about building this a uh, large scale economic vision for our eight county region. And that includes starting with the data and research. So really making sure that we're, we're kind of building that baseline summary of what's going on in our region and what do we need to build on. Uh, capacity building. So if this is a program that's really focused on disinvested communities, making sure that, um, that everybody who wants to participate has the capacity and ability to participate and to build projects. And then finally, community engagement, which will be a really important part of the work uh, we'll be, we'll be um, making sure that whatever we're building is responsive to the needs of communities. And then if you go all the way over, you think about some of the, um, some of the representation in terms of our disinvested communities about who needs to be at the table. So that includes tribes, community-based organizations, members of those disinvested communities, um, vulnerable populations like um, English as a second language and, and plenty of others as well. And then finally, uh, the state has defined kind of what they want to see in, the, in terms of who's an, a member of the collaboration. And, um, you know, it covers a lot of different categories, but suffice it to say, it needs to be a diverse collaborative that's really bringing a lot of stakeholders um, to the table and helping making decisions together. So I've talked a little bit already about what the vision of SURF is, but I just really want to emphasize this is a very transformative opportunity for our region to bring some resources in to invite more investment and to build this regional inclusive economic vision. Uh, we'll have the opportunity to elevate historically marginalized communities to really activate those types of or the types of projects that would support their needs and goals, um, create a really robust pipeline for investments um, through SURF and other sources. And then also just build our regional capacity for being able to collaborate on these kind of these big picture, large regional visions. So, you know, the opportunity is all about surf, but it's also much bigger than surf. And it really uh, is kicking off a, a chance to um, to really identify what we need and, and find the resources to do it. So if we think about the role of Placer County and the opportunities that we see, um, first, to communicate and seek alignments with your priorities, your opportunities, your challenges. We're going to want to be very, very engaged um, with your county so that not only are you represented and, and, and coming along to create this vision, but as we think about the types of projects that are getting elevated and articulated, that it really reflects um, your needs and your interests. Um, next is to participate in the collaborative. And I'll say that as we went through that application uh, process, Placer County has signed on as a member of the collaborative. I want to really thank Gloria Stearns for her participation in the ways that um, that you've made yourself accessible to us. And, um, you know, we'd really like to help grow Placer's representation so that um, as, as we're building out this collaborative, that your interests really are front and center. And then finally, we want to identify and activate high priority projects in Placer County. So that's all part of the part of the big picture of, of how we're building this vision. Next slide, please. Some of our next steps, so I'll note we, we put our application in July, we've been waiting on the state, we expect our contract to start um, in the next few weeks, I believe, so we're really just on that like very early stage of just getting started and, and expecting to, uh, to kick off in earnest in February, but we're going to be building a strong and cohesive coalition, so that means continuing our outreach. We actually have a, um, a hybrid kickoff event that we're planning on February 13th. It's going to be the kickoff of SURF um, paired with an event that we're doing that's called the Climate Justice and Jobs Summit, 
where we're really looking at inclusive pipeline uh, and career opportunities in clean economy jobs. Um, a really important early action will be advancing key research analysis to inform the plan. So we're doing an inventory and gap analysis of regional data assets, um, as well as, as identifying where we, where we need to build new assets. And then finally, I'm gonna, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is this economic development pilot project, which is a source of funding that the state's making available right away in order to kick off some high priority projects. Next slide. So this is called the SURF Economic Development Pilot Project, um, and they are basically funding projects. Um, I think they're gonna be releasing their solicitation for proposals in the next couple weeks, um, where they're gonna be, there's $50 million um, from the pool of, from the state overall. They're looking to fund projects for up to $10 million, and they would like to fund one in every geography. And so we're communicating about this. We haven't had time to pull our coalition together to really weigh in on this, but this opportunity is available and it's, it, it's a chance to, um, to advance some kind of ready to go projects that align with the, um, with the values and the priorities of the program overall. And here's a little bit more information, um, but, but like I said, the solicitation for proposal will be really soon. And um, uh, we wanna make sure our region is really ready and able to put our high priority and kind of those early ready to go projects forward. So we'll continue to communicate with the coalition and others about this opportunity as it, um, as, as it comes together. And then finally, you can see our contact information, um, including both an email that you can, um, if you have any questions, as well as the link on our website that um, that really has all of our materials from the very beginning um, about the SURF program. And again, I want to thank you for having us today, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, no questions right now. I have to apologize. Gloria Stearns was uh, our economic development director was supposed to kick this off, <clears throat> and I uh, bypass that. And I'm sure you're a very vital part of this for Placer County. So if, if you have any comments or have you wanted to make any Thank you. Um, just a brief comment. I, I think it's a pleasure to work with Evan and her team. She was one of the people that I met early on in my tenure here, so thank you, Evan, for including us in this. Um, this was already rolling before I got here. Um, but we also see some overlap with the Metro Lab network efforts that we're trying to do here as well. So I think that's going to be a great opportunity for us, and I look uh, forward to continued work efforts and work with Evan and her group as well as the whole coalition. Thank you. Okay, and so the next steps is when is it February? 13 for a regional meeting? Yes, yeah, so it'll be February 13th, um, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. And we'll be holding both virtual and in-person. So in-person will be at the Mac Powell Event Center and um, virtual will be via Zoom. Thank you. Is there any nope. board member comments? I see uh, <laughs> Supervisor Jones, did you have a comment? Yes, I've got a couple of questions actually. Sure. Good morning, Gloria. And thank you so much, Evan, for a, a great report. Um, I've got a couple of questions on some definitions here because I'm, it's confusing to me. I have, I'm from a science background, so you know some of this shouldn't be alien to me. But in the first paragraph on your background, um, you're talking about um, California seeks to advance regional economic recovery and resilience by creating high quality jobs in low carbon industries. So I'm just curious, what does that mean? What, what are considered low carbon industries? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and I would actually almost uh, want to articulate that as um, maybe occupations uh, that are responsive to low carbon industries. So really looking across our sectors and, um, and thinking about how is it that we're making a transition, whether it's in energy, in transportation, in some of our uh, tech industries and some of our manufacturing industries, but but where are the areas that we're able to um, to make a more of a transition to low carbon economies? And I, I think it really shows up across industries and across sectors and can be really um, thought of more as occupations. I will note that um, you know this is a big emphasis of the state, and one of our early um, one of our early actions is going to be to really dive into just that issue. So if we're talking about a clean economy, what does that really look like? What's the share of the economy now? What's the potential in our economy to grow those occupations, grow those, those sectors and industries? Um, 
And where can we really take some concrete action that will, you know, whether that's creating training pipelines or, or other types of actions that make those jobs more accessible. But I think that, you know, it's a great question of like, how are we really defining either a low carbon or clean economy? And I think that I want to really bring that to ground this project so that when we're talking about that, people really understand um, what kind of jobs those are and, and what that means. <clears throat> okay, and then the other question I have is you're addressing prioritizing disinvested communities. Do you have an idea of what those disinvested communities are? Yeah, I think there's both a, um, a geographic framework to that as well as a um, kind of historically marginalized um, community. So to speak to on the geographic side, um, the state has a, a few different tools where they've identified census tracts that have been kind of um, historically economically disadvantaged. Uh, and they also look at an overlay of health and I think um, environmental harms as well when they're thinking about this, um, this concept of disadvantaged communities across the, across the state. And, um, and like I said, there's a few different tools and overlays where they provide some guidance over what those census tracts are. Um, and I think we'll see more of that as this program gets kicked off. And then um, there's also an emphasis for communities of color, um, which have been identified as communities that have been marginally, that have been kind of historically excluded from um, economic activity in different ways. And the state has also defined um, some of those categories as communities of color, but also like uh, focusing on tribes. We mentioned, you know, English as a second language. I think there's, there's a few different frameworks that they have advanced. Um, to help us think about that. It's all pretty defined through the program. And I think there'll be some early work um, for our region though, to, to make sure we understand what that looks like in our region um, and how we're conceptualizing that as a, as a coalition. Okay, and then finally, um, in the last paragraph, second sentence, it says, in this role, Valley Vision will create the container for the collaborative to come together. I'm just wondering what, what is the container? It's the governance structure. So the coalition right now, uh, we have over 100 people who have signed on and committed to be a part of this coalition. As part of that, we, you know, it's going to be our job to staff and, and, and create uh, a leadership council. And that leadership council is going to be empowered to be the decision making body for the project. And, and Valley Vision um, will support that will, in terms of providing information, um, helping, you know, helping manage that process and that. Um, that body. Um, there's also going to be subcommittees that lead up to that. You know, I think that when you're talking about a diverse eight county region, there's going to be some complexity in terms of how we're thinking about the structure of that coalition overall. And so, you know, saying that we're going to provide the container is maybe a, a fancy word to say that we're not going to own all the decision making and all the actions. Rather, we're going to support this coalition in order to do that together. Okay, great. Thank you, Evan. I appreciate the, your answers. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, any other board member comments? Seeing none, is there anyone in the audience that wishes to address the board on this item? Please come forward. Hi, Jennifer White, uh, Placer County. Um, my, my question would be this. Um, a lot of these counties have a pretty big agricultural um, development or, or economic area, is this something that you would be um, trying to regulate um, as well? Because I'm hearing all these buzzwords of going green, aligning with state climate issues. So um, I know in a lot of other countries, um, farming, cattle, all these things are considered not green. They go against most guidelines. So are you guys going to be working into regulating that as well? Because I know our county has quite a large agricultural uh, community. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And I, you know, I want to note that our, that our food and ag sectors are, you know, not only incredibly important to the eight county region, but have also been identified in our current economic strategies as our high growth, like our, our like one of our key most important sectors. This project is not geared towards re towards regulations. Um, we're really about building, seizing, and kind of leveraging opportunities uh, to to grow those those high potential sectors. And so, 
Um, our goal is to create job opportunities within the, the food and ag sector. It's to think about uh, where's advancement opportunities for that sector to build on, um, you know, build on their own aspirations. Um, and, and there is a focus on low carbon, but it's not about striking down areas that um, that don't fit that definition. It's really about building up opportunities and and, um, and leveraging and, and building our assets. Thank you. Is there any more public comment? All righty. Uh, our county executive officer had a comment. Thank you, Chair Holmes. I just wanted to thank you, Evan, for a very informative presentation and thank Gloria for mentioning the Metro Lab Network. Um, Evan, we've been working with your Valley Vision predecessor, Bill Mueller, um, together with the Metro Lab Network in Washington, D.C., which is a national consortium of town and gown partnerships. We actually convened together in November with representatives from Sierra College, William Jessup, CSUS Placer Center, as well as our Evolving Climate Wildfire Institute, uh, which we hope to locate in the basin, to talk about potential work we could do together. And SURF was cited as one potential promising opportunity, so I'd love to invite you to our next gathering to share a little bit more on how our Placer Consortium, which is already ready to go, can take advantage of this opportunity. That's fantastic. I'm familiar with that effort and would love to get more involved. And I agree, it seems like a great fit um, with the SURF program. So thank you. All righty, thank you. Seeing no more com public comment uh, or board member comments, I just want to thank you. This sounds like an exciting thing moving forward. And uh, I look forward to working with our uh, Economic Development Director as we uh, move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. And so with that, we will move to our Let's see. 9B. 9B, our um, department item 9B with uh, this young lady. Megan. Megan. Good morning, Chair, members of the board, and congratulations and welcome, Supervisor Landon. I'm Megan Marshall, your Director of Public Health, and first want to apologize for not being there in person to present this item. Unfortunately, I'm trapped in my cul de sac from falling debris from uh, last night's storm. So. Um, <laughs> Here, here today requesting this board's approval for an evergreen re uh, revenue agreement with the Department of Healthcare Services for county-based Medi-Cal administrative activities, which is abbreviated to CMA. Uh, this item might sound somewhat familiar to you all as I presented an item to this board for approval in June of 2022 regarding the quality assurance consultant for the same program. Uh, so under Welfare Institution Code, CMA became a, a Medi-Cal program in 1995 and allowed for participating local government agencies to receive federal reimbursement for the cost of performing administrative activities that directly support efforts to identify and enroll potential eligible individuals into Medi-Cal. Uh, through the CMA program, uh, individual county agencies promote access to health care for clients um, in the county public health system, minimize health care costs, and uh, long-term health care needs for at-risk populations. Uh, Placer County Public Health Division has been participating in this program since uh, fiscal year 17-18. Um, in addition to participating in these activities directly, um, currently we, we have a number of programs in our public health division as well as our veteran services office. Um, we also coordinate um, and submit claims on behalf of community-based organizations who also perform these activities. Uh, this ever, uh, evergreen revenue agreement will allow for us to continue these important activities without administrative interruption. So with that, happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for... Uh from the board member, board members. Seeing none, is there any public comment? Anybody from the public want to address this item? We have anybody online? I see none, Chair. There's none, no public comment. I'll close the public comment portion and ask for a motion. It's been moved and seconded to approve, to adopt a resolution to approve an evergreen revenue agreement with the Department of Health Care Services for county-based Medi-Cal administrative activities and authorize the Director of Health and Human Services to sign this agreement with risk management and County Council concerns. Yes. Um, this is, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, any abstentions? Thank you, uh, oh, I said aye, <laughs> just, so, just for the record. So, thank you, we will close that item. And now we will move to item 10A, 
Correctional Food Services Program, Brett Wood. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Brett Wood. I'm your Purchasing Manager. Um, with me today, I have the South Placer Jail Commander, Captain Nelson Resendez, and my Contract Administration Team. Our request for your board today is to authorize an increase to the existing contract with Summit Food Services of Roseville, Minnesota, in the amount of $1.5 million, resulting in a revised contract amount of $14.7 million. In addition, at this time, we're asking for your board's approval for the first of three additional two-year renewals in the amount of $9 million for the period of July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2025. As part of that item, the actual renewal contract attached indicates a value of $8.9 million. We added $100,000 to be compliant with our procurement policy, which allows for some change order authority. So as a little bit of background for your board, this contract was originally presented in 2018 and approved for a five-year agreement. Since that time period, there have been numerous changes to the program services in addition to just the food service being provided to the South to both of our jails as well as our juvenile detention facility that have resulted in an increased cost. Inflation over that time period has impacted our meals by about 15%. During the COVID pandemic and the quarantine time periods necessary for that, we were utilizing what they call disposable trays, which have an increased cost to the county versus reusable plastic trays that we can run through a dishwasher. So those elements, in addition to purchasing paper products, um, normal paper products that are used in jail services in the food. We all, in the past, we maintained separate contracts for those. This contractor has a higher purchasing volume, volume than the county and subsequently receives a better pricing for that. None of those components were factored into that original $13.2 million contract. Um, so that's that resulting in the request for the 1.5 to finish out the remaining five months of this year. In addition, what we, as a f internal service fund program, we prepare our budget early to allow the departments to build their budgets, which is why we're bringing the renewal contract to you now because we've worked with the vendor to negotiate a mutual agreeable contract with a 9% increase in the cost that is directly attributable to current market conditions and the inflation that we've seen in food prices over the past several years. So this, the renewal contract goes into place on July 1st with a resulting increase that's reflected in the attached contract. With that, both I and the team, as well as Captain Mercendez, are available if you have any questions. Any questions from board members? I see none so far. Uh, anybody from the public wish to address this item? <clears throat> I see none. All right, we're being asked to authorize an increase to the existing contract with Summit Food Services in the amount of $1.5 million, resulting in a revised, not to exceed contract of $14,700,000, authorize the first three additional two year renewals in the amount of $9 million for the period of July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2025, and authorize the purchasing manager, manager to execute all required documents. Is there a motion? I'll move approval. I'll second. Supervisor Landon, did you have a comment? A no, I was just turning my mic on. Oh, make sure it worked. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, there's a motion in a, sec to, in a second to approve the item. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Uh, hearing none, the item is approved. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we'll <clears throat> move to item 1040, uh, our 1040 a.m. item uh, five public works, traffic mitigation fee adjustment, Granite Bay Fee District. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Holmes, members of the board. Welcome, Supervisor Landon. My name is Katie Jackson. I'm a senior engineer with the Department of Public Works. The item before you today is a fee adjustment for the Granite Bay District of the countywide traffic fee program. The countywide traffic fee program was established in 1996. The Granite Bay Fee District is one of 11 fee districts that make up the program. This fee is only paid by new development, and the fee program is a mechanism for new development to pay their fair share toward needed transportation improvements. 
This adjustment is requested to increase the project cost for the Douglas Boulevard widening project, which would provide six lanes on Douglas Boulevard from Sierra College Boulevard through the cabot stallman Road South intersection. Recently, the construction cost for this project was estimated at 1.62 million. The adjustment would increase the, tra the Granite Bay traffic fee by 6.1%, bringing the fee to $8,440 per dwelling unit equivalent. This project has, this widening project has been on our project list since 2009. Increasing the funding for this project could accelerate the implementation of it. The adjustment also ensures that all new development projects in Granite Bay are paying their fair share towards this improvement. So the action requested today is to conduct a public hearing and adopt a resolution to modify the capital improvement program cost estimates and corresponding capital countywide traffic fee schedule for the Granite Bay Fee District to reflect an increase in construction cost of 6.1%. We also ask that the board determine that the proposed action is exempt from environmental review under CEQA guidelines section 15273A4. If approved, the fee adjustment would become effective on March 13th, 2023. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions regarding this item? Yes. S Supervisor Jones. <clears throat> of course. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for that. Um, I'm just curious about a couple things, that's all. And um, so who, who pays the traffic mitigation fees? Traffic mitigation fees are paid by new development, so any new development that adds traffic to the roadways in a particular fee district. Okay. So, well, we're working on Granite Bay here, right? Yes. And so any of the pro projects that are currently building in, in, my, in, in Granite Bay, they wouldn't be affected by this? So the fee is paid at the issuance of building permits. So when they come in for their building permit, they'll pay the fees that are effective at that time. Okay, so all those have already paid their building permits and everything because they're already underway, very, very well underway. Yeah. Um, so what I'm curious is, what is it that triggers um, our need to adjust the fees? So this fee program is, uh, the adjustment is specific to that one project, the Douglas Boulevard widening project. Um, the, the new cost estimate came in significantly higher than what was in the fee program to begin with. And the reason that we want to adjust it is to potentially um, accelerate the implementation of that Douglas Boulevard widening project. Right. Okay. And so how, how does DPW decide the amount? Do you just basically look at what you have in, in the pot and then how much more you need to, to complete those? So there's a, a project cost listed for each individual project. and so. What we found was that the, the project cost for that one was underfunded um, versus the actual construction costs. As you know, the construction costs have increased significantly over, over the time, and so um, we're, we're trying to bring that up to the actual construction cost for this particular project. Right. So my question, too, might be that it was um, one of the projects, is it White Hawk 1, that triggered the um, so increase in the lanes? There's, so there's two White Hawk projects, right. as you know, White Hawk 1 and 2. The first project to proceed was uh, conditioned to design the uh, Douglas Boulevard widening project, and then the second project to proceed was the one that was supposed to construct the project. Okay, so I'm just curious how is it that those, we knew that they were going to trigger the widening, how come those aren't paying into the traffic mitigation fees because they've already pulled all their building permits and are well underway, at least for White Hawk 2, but not White Hawk 1. As Ken, do you know if White Hawk 1 pulled any, any building permits and or will they be paying? <laughs> so Ken Grimm with the Department of Public Works. So there are two White Hawk projects. Yes. Um, one of them, the ones that are pulling permits right now, which is White Hawk 2, um, they would not participate in this increase of cost, at least for any of the units that they've already paid a permit for. I'm not sure if they've paid permits for every lot okay. within that subdivision. Um, White Hawk 
One is the one that's in condition to do this work. We were just made aware about the increase in cost. They're looking, they're preparing the plans to get that work done. It'll be a quality improvement on that corridor. Uh, they've made us aware of it. It was always planned to be 100% funded through the fee program. And so we do the best we can and, and try to make that adjustment once we know about it. But we cannot go back in time. Right, right. Okay. Um, I guess that that helps me. Thank you so much. Great. <laughs> Can I ask a point of clarification? Yeah. Part of the reason the costs are going up is just because construction, labor, materials, all of those costs have gone up, correct? Oh, absolutely. Right. There's no magic or and something's not changed. It is a project right. that is always planned to be, but things are going kind of crazy out there. Yeah. That could be true for other projects within our fee programs. This is one we believe that is more imminent. Uh, that someone is preparing to build it sooner rather than later, and we want to make sure that we can have it funded in the appropriate time frame. Yeah, and I mean, I think what's so frustrating, we all are experiencing the cost of inflation. And we just saw it on our last item with meals in the jail, right? You sort of gulp at 9% increases. Um, this is what, a 6.1% increase, something like that. I mean, we're, we're just seeing that across the board, which is certainly frustrating for everyone, but it's, we have to charge to do the business, you know, the cost of doing business. So certainly see your frustration. These projects have been built prior to inflation going crazy. And it does ensure that your issue. board's policy has always been that development pays its way to, to do these improvements. It ensures that the rest of the county taxpayers aren't on the hook right. to build it. So this is an opportunity to make sure that at least all the remaining development within the Granite Bay area is paying their fair share of that improvement. Right. And my main reason for asking questions is really for clarification for my constituents. They all are wondering things and, you know, it, it really helps them to wrap their head around it. And really the increase, quite honestly, is not that much. However, when I look at all of the benefit districts, we are one of the higher ones on this, this exhibit one, you know. Absolutely. So, I, I think Granite Bay for the, the county traffic impact fee program, uh, it's all based on how many improvements are within that district divided by how much development is left over and particularly with Granite Bay being kind of getting towards the end of their development cycle. They don't have as many units to still complete the amount of work that's left to be done. Right. Well, so Ken, how is it going to work when we need to add um, deceleration lanes and acceleration lanes that we haven't, I mean, we know we're going to have to but we it's not mandated right now so anything that is not in the current cip that may in the future be needed mm -hmm. uh, if there is no development left to pay for it then it will be up to the public works department through our grants that we get and other programs that we have to have money or our gasoline tax revenues to do those kinds of improvements right. we do the best we can I, and i think we've shown we've gotten a lot of work done over the right. past 10 20 years can I say it's perfect in the end? Can't say that, but uh, we are doing a, a substantial amount of work with the money that we've raised, trying to ensure, again, based on your board's policy, development pays their fair right. share of what's required, and we can only know what we know today. Exactly. So the park at Granite Bay, that's one of our newer uh, subdivisions on Sierra College, but it is an unincorporated Granite Bay. Correct. And so when they both they will be included in this increase absolutely yes yeah. okay okay and i will say you do do an excellent job yeah. <laughs> my comments are not Understood. anything about that thanks Thank ken all righty <clears throat> seeing no uh, board member comments this is a public hearing so i'm going to open the public hearing and is there anyone from the public that wishes to address uh this item anyone online i see none Chair. see none all right, we'll close the public hearing. And we're asked to adopt a resolution modifying the capital improvement program costs and corresponding countywide traffic fee for the Granite Bay Fee District to adjust an increase in construction costs of 6.1%. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, move the item. All those in favor, please say aye. Number two as well. Oh, no, okay. Oh, okay. Hi, okay, and now we're asked, I'm asked to, to do public, the, that item has been approved, okay. So now we're gonna move to uh, item 5A2, determine that the proposed action is exempt 
from Environmental Review under the California Environmental Quality Act Guidelines Sections 15273. Is there a motion for that one? It's been moved and seconded to approve the item. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. All right, now <clears throat> we'll move to item, our 10.50 a.m. timed item, item 6A, Community Development Resource Agency, Minor Amendment, Short-Term Rental Vacation Rentals Ordinance. Chris, Crystal. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. I'm Crystal yes. Jacobson with our uh, Tahoe Cedra office. Um, <clears throat> the item before your board today is a minor amendment to the county's uh, short-term rental ordinance, which applies uh, only to the East Placer area. Uh, we are requesting your board introduce and waive oral reading of the ordinance uh, to amend uh, Placer County Code Chapter 9.42, specifically sections uh, 9.42050C1 and 9.42100D. <clears throat> the um, short-term rental ordinance was originally adopted by your board in November of 2019. As I think most of you are aware, the ordinance has since been updated and was actually repealed and replaced by your board in February 2022. Uh, in November, this last November, um, staff were made aware of some concern regarding uh, the two sections that I um, identified that we are asking uh, your board to consider amending. Um, these sections outline the county's ability to deny or revoke SDR permits. Uh, both provisions state that the county may deny or revoke a permit if the uh, short terminal property owner, agent, or guest is currently in violation of, has previously been found to be in violation of, or is, an under, or, or is under investigation of a violation of any local, state, federal law, statute, rule, or regulation. So both of those one provision applies to denial and the other one applies to revocation um, and they both state that uh, provision. I will state these provisions have been included in the STR ordinance since its initial adoption in November 2019. Um, after further review of this language, uh, staff has determined that these sections are potentially inconsistent with the State of California Fair Employment and Housing Act. And so as such, uh, we believe they are difficult to identify, enforce, and uniformly apply to all property owners, agents, and guests. I do wanna point out, to, um, as, as of today, we have not em employed these provisions. I also wanna point out we do have other criteria and provisions that are outlined in the code that allow us um, the ability to deny or revoke an SDR permit. So for example, if folks aren't paying their TOT taxes or they're not, um, they don't have a permit or they're, in violation of parking standards over and over again. We have other ways to deny or revoke a permit. So these are just two specific uh, provisions that were included in those sections. <clears throat> um, as directed by your board, we do continue to focus on adaptive management. Uh, we have held two meetings with the STR stakeholder working group. We did run this amendment by that group. We are framing up another package of amendments, more of a cleanup of the ordinance that we are um, anticipating we would bring forward in the spring. However, given the concern regarding these two sections that I just addressed, um, we are recommending that your board take immediate action to eliminate them. So um, with that, we uh, request that the ordinance be introduced at this uh, board meeting and then it would be brought back at a subsequent board meeting uh, for final adoption. And if the ordinance is adopted, it would be effective 30 days later. And then again, we anticipate being before your board again in the spring with um, some minor cleanups to the ordinance. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I also have uh, Eric here with County Council's office if you have any questions for him. Okay, thank you, Crystal. Any questions, comments from board members? I see none. Is there any public comment on this item? I see no public comment. Um, any other comments from staff? Supervisor right. or Chair, I yes. have one comment. I oh. just, since there was no public comment and no board member comment, I just wanted this point in history to be remembered <laughs> on short-term <laughs> rentals. Sorry. <laughs> it, it is a minor amendment, right? It is a minor <laughs> amendment, but nonetheless, it has generally spurred a lot of discussion. So I know we'll be coming back with future items, um, but I appreciate this moment. I'm happy to make a motion to approve this. And I will second it. And this is a proof of a, how uh, the adaptive management program actually works. So yeah. uh, Yes, indeed. There's a motion and second <laughs> on the floor to approve this item. 
Item 10, uh, Community Development Resource Agency Minor Amendment for the Short-Term Vacation Rentals Ordinance. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is approved. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh -huh. Mr. Chair? Yes. Before we move to our next item, uh, I need to be excused for a moment and maybe we just take a short little break yeah. because this is the last real item that we have before closed session, correct? Uh, we have, well, yeah. <clears throat> well, actually, this one's going to be. Short continuous, and then you'll have a break. Yeah. So may we just take a sure. short break? Yeah, sure. That would be yeah. great. Thank you. <clears throat>
Uh, in session, and we're going to go to item uh, uh, our 11 a.m. timed item, Parks and Open Space. Our Parks and Open Space Interim Director, Josh Hunsinger. Uh, good morning and Happy New Year, Chair Holmes and Board. Um, Josh Hunsinger, I'm the Interim uh, Parks and Open Space Director, among other things, for the county. And um, so the item today we are requesting a continuance on um, after uh, we passed the, uh, the deadline for the board packet. We did identify a discrepancy in one of the documents. And so we are asking that your board continue this item to a future date. Already. Any objections? Do we need to take a motion on this? We need a motion and we need to know what the date and time certain oh. is. <clears throat> Yeah, is there a date and time certain? Chairman, we would request that this be moved to February 14th at 9.40 a.m. Okay. I'll move approval of that, and Josh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize your item was at 11 a.m., and I wouldn't have asked for the break until after you were done, so my apologies to make you wait a little bit longer. That's okay. <laughs> uh, we have a motion. Is there a second? second? It's been moved and seconded to approve the item, uh, the continuance. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, any abstentions? Hearing none, the item is moved. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, what am I doing next? Now we're gonna go into closed session and I'll have the uh, County Council let us know what we're doing. The board will now move to closed session to consider uh, five items of existing litigation.
All righty, we've just returned from closed session. County Council will give a report out. The board met in the closed session and considered the following. Under existing litigation, County of Placer versus Mathiopolis 3M Family Limited Partnership et al. The board heard a report and authorized settlement on a 5-0 vote. In re Frank Domier, the board heard a report and authorized settlement on a 5-0 vote. In re Robert Miller, the board heard a report and authorized settlement on a 5-0 vote. In re Parnell, the board heard a report and authorized settlement on a 5-0 vote. In re Slater, the board heard a report and authorized settlement on a 5-0 vote. That concludes this portion of the report out of closed session. Thank you. <clears throat> and now uh, we move to our 11.30 a.m. timed item. This is uh, item 8A, County Executive Resolution Modifying the Olympic Valley Alpine Meadows Microtransit District Management District Plan. And we're going to hold the public hearing. But, oh, <clears throat> Ms. Roback. Hello, Chair Holmes and board members. Uh, very nice to see you today, coming to you live from snowy Tahoe. Um, and I am here today with you to hold, uh, for you to hold a final public hearing and an adoption to modify the current Olympic Valley Alpine Meadows Microtransit Management District Plan. Uh, the current plan has been in place since it was approved by your board in 2018 and would have expired on September 30th, 2023. Uh, as you're aware, the Olympic Valley Alpine Meadows uh, Microtransit District requested a modification to the current MVP to terminate it early uh, as of uh, January 31st, 2023. This is due to the fact that the district has been renewed, again, thanks to approval by your board on December 6th, and a new management district plan is set to begin on February 1st. So the action requested of you today is to hold a public hearing, declare results of protest proceedings, and adopt a resolution to modify the current management district plan. And you're also asked to determine that these actions are not a project pursuant to CEQA guidelines section 15378. Um, and so with that, um, I am happy to answer any questions. Any questions from board members? <clears throat> Seeing none, uh, this, uh, we're gonna open up a final public hearing. <coughs> And we're going to declare the results of majority protest proceedings and adopt a resolution modifying the Olympic Valley Alpine Meadows Microtransit District Management District Plan. Is there a Chairman, dollar? we received no protest on this matter. All righty. Uh, do we take these separately, both separately? Um, did you want to ask for any public comment? Oh, is there any public comment? I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, we'll seeing none, so the public hearing is closed. And take them. You can take them together as okay. soon as you read them. All righty. We're asked to hold the, well, we did the public hearing, um, declaring the results of the majority protest proceedings and adopt a resolution modifying the Olympic Valley Alpine Meadows Microtransit District Management District Plan and determine that the proposed action, actions are each not a project pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act Guidelines Section 15378. Is there a motion? Um, I'd be pleased to make that motion. Oh, I'm and then sorry. after I, I have a couple comments. Sure. Okay. I'll second. Okay. It's been moved to se <coughs> second to move the item. All those in favor, please say aye. Roll call. Aye. Oh, roll call. Roll, roll. No. Yeah. Jones? Aye. Gustafson? Aye. Gore? Aye. Landon? Aye. Holmes? Aye. Okay. Now, Supervisor Gus. Uh, thank you. Supervisor Holmes. Um, I, I just wanted to make the point that I think too often um, many residents in our community forget that many of the services we are being able to provide both as a county and uh, by our business community are because the business community is assessing itself. And on pages 307 through 334, you see how many individual businesses and property owners have voted to assess themselves. And this is not the only assessment. On top of this is the generalized wide T-bid uh, for the whole region. 
And uh, of course, many of these also pay um, the TOT taxes as well. So that is providing a huge revenue stream that is providing this micro mass transit. And I just, you know, we're getting inundated with emails on future development and things. And I think we just need to recall that our business community really is stepping up to try to, ex uh, to address the current problems without any development. We still have a lot to solve. But 715000 a year just from this one, from these businesses, is a great step forward. And I want to commend uh, all those businesses. And this is a weighted vote to remind you. We don't see the weighting here, um, but obviously the major lodging properties along with the ski area are the predominantly um, the, the largest contributors. So just wanted to let you know that. Thank you. And thank our business community for that support. Alrighty, <clears throat> that concludes that item. Now what are we doing? We're going to go to the last apartment item. The last apartment oh, item. Oh, that's where you're getting up. Okay. <laughs> and that's uh, item 11, clerk of the board, 2023 board and commission assignments. <clears throat> okay. Good morning, board members. It feels a little bit odd to be on this side of the table with you all since I am very used to my spot up there. Um, as you know, the board every year goes over their annual assignments and we, we've done it a little bit differently this year thanks to conversations that we had during governance and direction that you gave to staff on how to reorganize the uh, committees and commissions and boards that you all serve on. So I want, we have this split up and we have kind of three groups, you know, um, we have the non-requested non changes. So this is where there are no changes from the prior year. And then I will go through the non-contested changes that we have, which is where there are changes, but everybody is in agreement. And then there will be a section where I'm asking for your direction on appointments to boards and commissions. So I'll kind of dive right into it. These first few slides are gonna go through quickly, but please feel free to stop me and at any point in time if you have questions or want to have further discussion. Okay, so as you can see, these are the first uh, slides. These ones we're having no changes on. CSAC, your board, took that in, um, I believe it was late November, so we did appointments to that. Uh, these ones are just going to remain the same. Same with these ones as well. So also I would like to note that um, for Economic Development Board, District 2 is staying on that and the board will be asked to actually make the appointment of Supervisor Landon to that one. So while this one, there is actually a slight change on. Okay, same here. So all of these ones are remaining. These are the district centric ones. So obviously these are the ones that have a little bit more impact in your board gave that direction to establish district-centric committees. Now that doesn't mean that those may only be served on by the supervisors that, um, that we've determined their districts are affected. Those can still be served on by any supervisor. All of the Tahoe stuff. And then your Veterans Memorial Hall boards, this is just one I like to note. All board members are voting members on their Veterans Memorial Hall boards. You also have the ability to appoint an alternate to that that would be a voting member in your place. So now we're gonna get to the non-contested changes. Um, this is where, you know, as, as I stated earlier, you know, Jane and myself met with each board member and you kind of went over, you know, we went over the ranking process and you ranked committees that you wanted to serve on one through three these are areas where there was no conflict in ranking um, so we'll go through those and I'll speak to each one so for Golden State the uh, connect authority this one district 5 had been serving as the primary and this is really a subcommittee of RCRC which supervisor Holmes serves on excuse me chair Holmes serves on so this is you guys in governance gave the direction that you would like to see this reverse so that Chair Holmes would be the primary and District 5 would move to the alternate. For air pollution control, this one's remaining the same just with the appointment of Supervisor Landon. 
Area 4 Agency on Aging, Supervisor Jones um, has requested to step into the primary position, which is much appreciated. This is a very difficult position to fill. It's been vacant for a long time, and I know that Area 4 will be very thankful that you've agreed to step into that. And Supervisor Holmes, or Chairman Holmes, will be remaining as the alternate. Flood control, this is just another point where Supervisor Landon needs to be confirmed as the District 2 representative. Middle Fork Project Finance Authority. So slight change here with Chairman Holmes remaining as a primary member, Supervisor Gustafson moving into a primary member, and Supervisor Landon will become the alternate on this one. South Placer uh, Regional Wastewater Authority. This is just a confirmation of Supervisor Landon. Placer County Transportation Planning Agency, Countywide Steering Committee, so this is a, another change where super, uh, supervisor, I'm sorry, prime, this was a District 2, sorry, <laughs> appointment. So District 2 did not rank this as one of their top ones, and it was ranked by Chairman as uh, Holmes as one of his top ones, so we went ahead and made that switch on that, and that is the same with the Treasury Review Panel. Highway 65 Joint Powers Authority, so this is where District 3 will be going into a primary as they were the only ones ranking it as number one. And it will be uh, District 2 coming off of it. District 1 will remain the alternate on this as has been in the past. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Highway 65 goes through District 2 and District 3. It does a little bit in the southern part, but the, the, but the money that's being collected is for the northern parts of Highway 65, like the Sunset Interchange from Blue Oaks north. Mm -hmm. So it might make more sense to have District 2 be the alternate instead of one. I'm interrupting. Sorry. That's okay. And we can, I mean, we, about it right now. we can have that conversation now or we can come back to it either way. Come back. Sorry, Megan. Okay. No worries. Um, Western Placer Waste Management Authority. So this is another one where we're confirming Supervisor Landon. So that completes all of our non-contested changes. And now we get into where conversations will be necessary and direction to staff. So, direction requested. As you can see, these are the ones where more supervisors have selected service on this than there are seats on that. And staff is asking for the board to take these individually and give us direction on which ones they wanna have. So I'm gonna go through these quickly and then I'll pull back to the slides and we can go through them one by one. But it's Criminal Justice Policy Committee, Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council, Sacramento Area Economic Council of Governance, Governments. County Audit Committee, I want, I'm gonna pause on this one. This one is really, um, there's not a, con, there's no, not multiple supervisors asking to serve. There's not enough supervisors asking to serve, so we just need to look at that. Uh, Golden Sierra Job Training Agency, uh, this, this is the same thing with this one. Uh, Homeless Task Force, Local Agency Formation Commission, Placer Conservation Authority, South Placer Regional Transportation Authority, Tribal County Advisory Committee. Um, the other thing that I will be asking you to do is these are staff appointments. So these are in the um, Mountain Counties Water Resource Association. That's an association that we pay to be part of and by, by default that goes to the CEO we have had a practice though of always designating any staff that serves on committees or associations for us. We just like to designate that in this process. So that's one that Jane will be serving. And then Stephanie Holloway has been serving as the alternate on many of the Tahoe items. This is, you know, makes the most sense as she is the deputy CEO over Tahoe and she's well versed and able to step in when Supervisor Gustafson is not available. Solid Waste Local Task Force, this is actually a new one, and uh, it was determined that we had 
we needed county presence at this. And typically, the thought would have been to have public work staff attend it. But public work staff is actually the one bringing items in front of this task force, so they didn't want to be the one staffing it. So we are going to request that it be the CEO or designee. I've also provided you with the 2020 appointment primary totals, as that was the conversation that came up. People wanted to know how many you know, um, committees each person had. And then this will be the recommendation that we're asking for. So with that, if the board would wish, I will go back to the direction requested slides and we can, we can dive into that. Megan, did, yes. you, did you want to take up the one that's um, under non-contested that uh, Supervisor Gore raised so we don't lose that one before you go on to the others? Yeah, we can do it that way. I mean, we can, if you'd like, we can take all of the, you know, we'll take direction on all of the no changes requested ones, and then we can go to the non-contested staff and then do handle at the very end the... Um, direction requested. And I think it's important to know, we're just asking for direction, so there's not a motion that we need on these ones. We just need to, everyone to, you know, let us know the changes that they wish for. So, going back. Let me figure out what slide that was on. It doesn't have numbers. So sorry. There it is. Highway 65, uh, Joint Powers Authority. So District 1, you're recommending that this go to? I'm, I'm happy to serve on it. I have been the alternate. It's not a lot of work, except that the funding now primarily is for improvements um, around the Rockland area, if I recall. Mm -hmm. um, Jim, are you, are you currently on that, or was it uh, Robert? Robert was on it that. Was it was Robert on that? Yeah. Um, and so most of the improvements are from Blue Oaks the, with the Sparta, or with the whatever fund that is. The South Plaza Transfer Authority. It's that extra fund, authority. right? Yeah. Um, that extra fee <coughs> going um, up towards Marysville. It doesn't, I'm happy to serve as an alternate. Yeah. Um, most of the the work is being done through Rockland and Lincoln, so yeah. that was my thought. And so, are you think uh, Supervisor Landon would be the alternate? She can be the alternate, or she can be the primary, <laughs> or you can be the primary. It doesn't matter so much. I just think it makes more sense since yeah, I, I those areas are represented more by District Two and Three versus One. Well, since I've been serving on the uh, PCTPA. Uh, for 18 years, uh, I think it's appropriate for me to be the primary on that because I do represent Rockland, <clears throat> that part of Rockland. So, but it's, I got plenty to do. Well, so. that's, your, your I am team. happy to have Supervisor Holmes be the primary and I will be the alternate. Okay, great. Okay, Wonderful, you. staff will make that change. So before moving on, did, was there anything that anyone wanted to talk about on the ones where we were, no changes were requested? We were okay there? Um, did you have one that no, was? No, no, I'm ahead, sorry. Cindy. Um, Chair Holmes is yeah. okay. Okay. Um, just in general, um, I thought this was a really helpful process and yeah. thanks staff for going through and the individual meetings and working with us because I know it has been a point of controversy. and. I, um, so in particular on uh, some of the uh, committees feel that there should be turnover occasionally because if not, a new supervisor never gets the opportunity because people have served at length and have a great history. But where I consider making those changes where I think it makes sense, but I, I, this is the whole point of this is to have a discussion, is where we don't have uh, where it's more an internal committee. So, for
for instance, on criminal justice. Um, I'd love to eventually be able to serve on that. I don't need to fight for it today, but I want to make it clear I'm giving that up in order to support the will of the board, but I, I would like us to consider at some point how we make those changes so that all of us get an opportunity to serve on the committees we want at some point during our term. Other ones uh, involve other board members, elected officials, and history and uh, leadership positions that people have earned over time, and I want to respect that you're representing us with um, that history. So I, I think this was a good step this year. I might go another step next year to say how long have they been held by a certain uh, individual, especially those general seats, so that we can have that discussion because I don't, none of us want to uproot somebody who really wants to serve on a committee but we're also not able to serve on that committee because of that. So it's just a point of discussion uh, for me to, to consider in the future that that might help us realize each of us has to give a little to get a lot in support of teamwork. So that was well said. my point. Supervisor Landon. <clears throat> Sorry, it was left over. You'll get used to it. <laughs> okay, then we're ready to proceed on to the other ones. <clears throat> Yes. So to your point, Supervisor So to Augustus, my point then. on criminal justice, someday I would like to serve on this. It's of great interest to me and great in my background, but I'm happy to defer to the current and stay as the alternate. Um, and certainly uh, one of the things, uh, you know, we can look at is, you know, trying to make sure that when there is a meeting where somebody's going to miss that the alternate be notified Absolutely. of that so yep. that we can attend or that person who wants to and attend. <laughs> okay. So with that, then we will leave Criminal Justice Policy Committee as, as is. District 3 is and District 4 with the primary and 5 is the alternate. Okay. I think I was the only other one who ranked it as number one. So thank you. Um, Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council. So currently serving District 1 and dis is the primary, District 4 is the alternate, and this was ranked number one um, by both District 1 and District 4. So what we're asking for is direction regarding who will take primary, who will take alternate. I'd like to continue serving, if I may, on uh, the GSEC board. I've been on the board now for uh, two years and actually just um, the last two weeks have been able to set up really integral meetings between some Roseville businesses, actually namely TSI, a semiconductor company, uh, knew the CEO and was able to work with GSAC to set up a meeting to start looking and collaborate on getting some of the federal CHIPS funds um, for this next round of dollars that are coming from the federal government. And I think that um, the work the, the contacts I know with all the businesses in Roseville have been very helpful as we have been working on getting meetings with regional partners and really looking at some funding. So I'd like to continue serving on the GSAC board. And the reason for my request again for the GSEC <clears throat> partly goes back to that it was a committee held by my predecessor um, that I would like to request it one more time. But in addition to that, um, I also serve on the Economic Development Board, <clears throat> and this goes hand in hand with the Economic Development Board. What doesn't make sense is that we get split. We split our economic development into two teams this way. And I know um, <clears throat> my section of, my portion of district, of the uh, Roseville in my district is a large part of economic development. It's all of, <clears throat> excuse me, please. It includes all of the fountains, the, um, the Galleria Mall, and uh, Costco, Sam's, Walmart, all those areas, all the areas of economic development that remained open during COVID are all in my portion of uh, Roseville. It's in District 4. So I have a lot of involvement as well. Um, and like I said, mostly important is serving on the Economic Development Board. They, the two should go hand in hand, I, I feel, working towards economic development for Placer County. 
And I think they can be split up. Um, I will say this as well. Most of the open land slated for development for new business in Roseville is in District 1. Anything off of Foothills Boulevard, Blue Oaks Boulevard, all that area um, is still in District 1 as far as future development within the Roseville city limits. Chair Holmes, is it possible to go through each of these and have people make their case and then come back? Sure. Because as we give things up or revise yeah. things, they impact other requests, and I think it yeah. might be helpful. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. Versus taking them one at a time. Sorry, Megan. No worries. I just, mm -hmm. however you guys want to take them, it's up to you. It, it's a poker hand, right? <laughs> so uh, trying to figure that out. Okay. okay, so the next one up is Sacramento Area Council of Governments. So currently serving District 1 as the primary, District 4 is the alternate, and again, this is another one where we're looking for direction. It was ranked 1 by both District 1 and District 4, um, so we're looking for direction on primary versus alternate. Any comments? Uh, County Audit Committee. So like, as I said, this is one where uh, Supervisor Jones has served on it for the last two years, I believe, and has requested to step down. And, you know, it, this is, it's one of the general appointments. It's an internal one. I, I have spoken with our auditor, Andy Sisk. There is, it does have two seats that are board members. So we do need to make a selection to that. Um, we're happy to take any recommendations or requests on that. So Same with Golden Sierra. May I ask a question? So yes. As you're going through, I want to ask some questions. So Suzanne, you're not interested in serving on the audit committee any longer? Uh, be a committee hog, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you and I have the least number of committees in 2022. Yeah, so. but I'm not sure the numbers are correct on there. Um, I believe, well, I do believe that Supervisor Gore, you have nine, and I, I, I saw on this it says states eight, but you should, you have nine total primary positions. Yeah. But other than that, we did check and they were. That and was I the do only still have eight. Change. Yeah, the last yeah. few years. If I may, uh, Supervisor Landon, this might be a good committee for you to be on because we meet with the county auditor uh, and uh, we go, I, is it quarterly? Yeah, uh, quarterly. Yeah, right. and, uh, and, and we find out it's a comfort to me because we know, I understand how the audit system works and how all the departments and the outside auditor works. Uh, it might be something that you might be interested in. I'm not trying to and, and Shanti, arm. I'm I'm happy to. I was going to volunteer too. So oh. it's up to you. If you are interested, please feel free. Otherwise, I can take it because I think I'm tied for the. Yeah. And I'm happy to. Yeah. I'm happy to serve if you don't want to. It's yeah. it's not a problem. Um, and you've got <laughs> TRPA. Okay. My my. I was going to ask just what the time commitment was. So mm -hmm. if it's uh, once a quarter and um, it's not a huge time commitment, then I'd be happy to. I am the rookie, so I'm happy to take on a committee oh, that's perfect. new. So it's a good committee. So are we decided, oh. are we going to talk about this later? Or? I was going to say, do you do you guys want me to keep moving well, we, on? We skipped over SACOG and we didn't hear the case for yeah. each yeah. supervisor. Okay. So if do we want to go back to SACOG and talk about the case and you know, let everybody make their positions known? There's two supervisors wanting that as primary. Do we want to move through, just for my own clarity, do you want to move through all of them, make the cases, and come back? Yeah. yeah. That's okay. what I was suggesting. Perfect. Here all right. are all the cases. So let me. Yeah. And then. Okay. I'm sorry. Megan. No worries. Fine. You're fine. Okay. Um, so I'll move on to Golden Sierra job training. Well, I didn't hear. Oh, you want to make all you want to hear all the cases from each supervisor on say as we go then. through. Oh. Yeah, that's what I was yeah. thinking. As you're talking about them, that's not fine. a problem. Oh. So say yeah. um, So I'm Susan. I'm interested in continuing to serve. Um, had the opportunity uh, to serve the last two years. I've actually been appointed or asked to to serve as chair of the mega region committee, um, which is the committee of the council of governments that includes SACOG plus San Joaquin County and the Bay Area Council of Government. So I've been asked to chair the mega region committee this year. And there's no problem with the, the uh, alternate to attend all the meetings. Uh, well, no Supervisor Jones, you were interested in serving? 
I don't yes. want to. Oh. <laughs> yes. Yes, and my, in my interest here is, is that it's also a tier one um, committee that is very connected to um, other counties or, you know, governance in general across the region. And both of these, GSEC and SACOG, um, are that type of committee. So I have an interest in serving in one, not necessarily both. I have a greater interest in serving in, the, in GSEC because it's economic tied with my economic council, uh, not so much Sacramento Area Council, but I would like to have one of those. And, and um, there again, GSEC is really more my number one priority because it was uh, one of my predecessors and I really do want to fulfill that to my constituents as well as I have a desire to um, work more in the economic development arena. Okay. On SACOG, how long have you served, Bonnie? Just the last, oh, actually four years. Excuse me, I guess I've been on the board for four years. I didn't realize. And GSEC two years. Just, okay. And you were the chair for yeah. SACOG? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then audit we talked about, so I'm sorry. No worries, Eric. <laughs> so Golden Sierra Job Training Agency. This is um, similar to the audit committee. Supervisor Jones would like to step down from this, as, as she stated, to take on other ones. Um, I, I believe the time commitment of this one is minimal as well. Any takers? <laughs> How often does that one meet? Okay. And what do you know what days and what times? Usually Thursdays, but they are flexible. There's conflicts. They'll work with the board members to all select the days that it's coming in. So far, we've only met um, online. No one's heard from me yet. I don't know how that'll go well with the changes in November. And I'm sorry, I, I missed something. Are you interested in not serving on that board any longer? Yeah. Yes, she, she would like to step down. Okay. Yeah, except we all have ones that aren't that taxing, right? Well, that's I mean, why I'm picking up the area for agency on aging because I'm, that's been vacant for two years. So I am stepping up to take that one because it is a very important with our aging population in Placer County and all over the, the greater region. So no, I'm not just giving up some, I'm, I'm taking on one that nobody wants. So, you know, in balance, I would like to take on one or two other committees. So I don't want to keep those and just, you know, empire build until I've got 15 or 16 committees. Okay. So is there any interest from any board member? Well, why don't we do this? I'm going to go through all of it. All right. And all right. I'll continue okay. going. Uh, homeless Task Force Committee. So this one is currently, um, the current service on this is, is District 1 and District 3. And all Districts 1, 3, 4, and 5 all rated this as, as rank 1. And Supervisor Landon rated it as rank 2. Okay, well, I can make a point that I understand the task force is wrapping up. I am very interested in serving on this, and again, in the future, and I just want to make that case known now so that maybe in the future I can serve on it. There's quite a few situations in my district that revolve around the homeless. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Um, I want the current committee, I think it's best for the current committee to wrap up the work they're on, and then we can talk about this again next year. So okay. I can take my name out of the hat on that one. And I feel similarly as Supervisor Gustafson that, um, well, I've had a desire to serve on this committee since the beginning, and I actually was on a homeless task force prior to this the uh, this one being um, made and uh, and I also have a lot of homeless in my district as well I, in fact I have a constituent 
who calls me up and leaves me messages. She says, this is my homeless report for the day. I see homeless people over here and over here. <laughs> so I make notes and go out and check it out. But there's nothing we can do unless they're on private property. So if the board agrees with the interest of having rotations on our more internal committees, what we could look at is um, the, homeless the Homelessness Task Force remaining as it is this year with a commitment for a change to come that, next This isn't year. internal right now. This is the external. Yes, I, and, I, and I guess yeah. I, I, I should clarify, I apologize. When I say internal, what I mean is there's no, um, this is a county, city, collaboration there's there's not bylaws driving this you know i mean we run into doing rotations with some of the larger like say cog or csac becomes problematic because they appoint to larger committees and other things and and so having rotations could affect those appointments this one because it's with internal into the county as a whole along with the cities we could look at a rotation to this and staff is just offering a suggestion and accepting direction on that one so if that's an interest, we could leave it as it is for this year. As Supervisor Gustafson said, allow the current board members to wrap up the work as it is where it's at now. That's good. An agreement on that? <clears throat> okay, so uh, LAFCO. So this one was served by former Supervisor Wygant and Supervisor Gustafson with uh, Chairman Holmes as the alternate. So this was requested as a rank one by districts two, three, and five. So looking for direction on that. District four did rank this as a three. I would like to just, I would like to serve as a LAPCO representative. <clears throat> and here's why. I've served 16, 16 years on the Placer Consolidated Fire Board. And when I was the president of that board, we, appeared, we made an application to the county to join Placer County Fire, and that came true because then I was on the board of supervisors that approved that. And, um, and since I've been on the board, I've helped uh, the Loomis Fire Protection District with their ballot measure, the Newcastle Fire Protection District with their ballot measure, and Penryn Fire District. Uh, I was deeply involved in all three of those. And now we're through doing a municipal service review of the fire districts throughout the county. And we also have a potential, uh, not an annexation, but a consolidation of two, two districts that are not contingent. And so for that reason, I'd like to, because that's strong background, I've, we've been through about at least four municipal service reviews. And this is very important for this one because everything's changed in, over the period of years. And so I would like to be the representative on that because of my background. Uh, I'm the alternate, I can uh, serve on that as well, but I wouldn't have as much input as far as being on the board. So that's, that's my, my uh, recommendation. Did you have a comment? I do have a comment. Oh, please do. And uh, I, I respect your opinion, and I uh, would not discount the fact that you have plenty of experience to serve on LAFCO. My argument, uh, argument, I guess, would be um, a large, the majority of the geographical area that's going to be annexed within these next few years through LAFCO that falls within District 2. Village 5 is a huge project that um, is going to impact the future of Lincoln for eternity. And it's really important to me um, to really build upon the relationship that we have with the city of Lincoln. And I think they're in a good place right now with a great city manager. They have a good city council. And uh, I would like to be their partner on not just the board, but on LAFCO. And I think when I look at what's coming down the pike in this next year, Village 5 being such a huge area with such a huge impact for the community and being that I've been involved with Village 5 for the last five years, um, I would highly, highly desire to serve on LACO. Supervisor Landon, I wonder if you'd be agreeable if there was an issue coming for the LAFCO, if I was the alternate, to take, take 
that seat while we're negotiating with the fire districts and the municipal service review. Was your question whether I would be amenable to letting you serve on during that time, like Just in those the conversations? Issue, if the, when the municipal service review comes for adoption mm -hmm. through the LAPCO board, would you be allow, would you be amenable to allowing me to sit there in your place? I would definitely be amenable to that. All right, well in that, in that regard, you make a good argument. So we've, we've got an agreement. Wonderful. All right. Thank you. Then I don't even have to plead my case. <laughs> I was already. <laughs> Thank you for working it out. Um, Placer County Conservation Authority, so current membership is District 1, is the primary. District 2 is a primary. District 4 is an alternate. And we have requests in Rank 1 from District 1, 2, and 4. So looking for recommendations on this one. Can you explain to me what the, when it is district centric, um, what does that mean for district two, I guess I would ask in this situation. So when, during governance, when we discussed these and, and one of the things that came up with uh, the PCA board in particular was that most of the conservation that will take place will be within district two. So it has a very heavy impact mm -hmm. on the district two area. So that's how this became district centric to your district. Okay, I was just trying to figure out if I need a lobby right now or whether this is a district two and then one other seat or I didn't know what the. Uh, so district centric does not guarantee it to the supervisor. Um, I, I believe that the intent of the board was that, but it, you know, we don't have any governing documents, you know, bylaws, resolutions or anything on this that would require it to be district two, so I can't automatically okay. put you there it was the conversation that I think we had during governance that was mm -hmm. to Megan's point most of the land that's in conservation is in district 2 mm -hmm. would make sense mm -hmm. um, that district 2 represent that right. um, and the reason I'm interested in continuing to serve on that board is because the development that's happening in the West Roseville area um, particularly Placer Vineyards they're actually utilizing the PCA for their projects. Yeah. So as all the Placer Vineyards get built out, they're utilizing the PCA uh, for projects yeah. to move forward, to get through the approval processes. Um, and this is one heck of a learning curve, as you know. Oh my goodness, I yeah. I, I thought SACOG was challenging. <laughs> Boy, this is. <laughs> No, I'm a lot <laughs> so it's, it's very interesting but boy so my question Megan is mm -hmm. so district 2 has the majority of the conservation area do you know what other districts has conservation land I do know that district 4 has conservation land and I believe that district 5 does have conservation land as well um, and so that is why I mm -hmm. um, have expressed interest in serving on it is because we do have conservation land in my district and particularly now that I have all of unincorporated Loomis, Penner, and Horseshoe Bar, and even a little wedge of Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Is that even, I'm curious. I don't know if that's the case. The area, like the purple map, you, oh, I, I don't remember the purple map maybe as much as you all do. To me, I think of the purple map as everything sort of to the west of I-80, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I Am I? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's really not, it's the, the conservation land is the purple land way back when the PC, PCCP yeah. was done. And it's land that's pretty much west I-80. Yeah, and there's developments that are in process now that you're working on with the conservation plan. Yeah. Oh, correct. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so. And I agree District 2 should be, be on that. Well, that doesn't make sense. If I have conservation land in my district, so it's the land approval, and Shanti may know member more than I, because she did the PC, worked with Robert on PCCP. The land that was set aside for future conservation easements and conservation where um, a development could pay into or buy um, to offset the mitigation, to pay for the mitigation or offset the mitigation for the development, most of that land is to the west of I-80. There's a huge map 
um, and most of that land is to the west of I-80. It's not, um, and some of it's like Hidden Falls up in that area, so that hits District mm -hmm. 5 now, that area. But I don't, there's probably very little of areas that are going to be utilized PCC. the PCCP in, on the other side of I-80. Right. Can I clarify something here? Please. Um, <laughs> the purple map, which did become the area targeted for conservation, you're absolutely right, is mostly, if not entirely, within District 2. Now, that doesn't mean that other areas of the county, including District 4, are not subject, are actually subject to mitigation pursuant to the PCCP. So two things going on yeah. here. Uh, that mitigation is actually countywide, although you, re you really don't see it up in the District 5, up in Tahoe, obviously. So you do have in District 4, you have projects, and we've seen this, that are required to mitigate their resource impacts by participating in the PCCP program and paying their mitigation. So just want to make sure everybody understands there's two things going on here. Yeah. There's nothing in the bylaws that identifies any, any specific district. That's in contrast to your new JPA with the regional uh, sewer in Lincoln, which it does specify one seat must be held by District 2. Mm -hmm. However, in all the work that's been done on the PCCP, and because most of the intricate work in terms of acquisitions of that area uh, for setting aside or easements happens within District 2. And I, to, to clarify one more thing, as, as Karen just stated, so this, we made these districts centric. And that was just, it, you know, that is not, like she said, it's not a requirement. And that was, when we talked about it at governance, that was the, the request was made and that was, reasoning was because most of this would occur into. But again, that doesn't mean that it doesn't have impact to other districts or that service from another district wouldn't be beneficial as well. So I just want to clarify, the district-centric piece does not have a requirement. Like Karen said, the only requirements will come from the JPAs or the bylaws of, of committees if they are specific to service. Well, then clarify for me the, dis the difference between land that has to be mitigated and land that can be dedicated as conservation areas. As, as so, so developments would ha may have to mitigate no, I understand the mitigation. And so the mitigation and Karen dive in at any time. What about the properties and the, that they're listing on those maps that can be dedicated as conservation land? And well, sort of like Hidden Falls, well, okay. where they're able to buy up the land and dedicate it. Okay, mm -hmm. let's 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 roll this back a little bit. When when the PCCP had to go forward for its permits from the federal and state agencies. What was important and what was frankly critical for that is identifying mitigation lands. Lands that could be set aside either in avoidance or lands that can be, uh, where mitigation credits could be purchased uh, or easements could be, uh, could be uh, recorded. So that particular, which is fondly referred to as the purple map, mm -hmm. it really hasn't changed through all the years is the area of highest habitat value that has been discovered. That doesn't mean that there aren't other individual projects that have high habitat value. However, under the PCCP, the principle is that rather than doing onesies, twosies of habitat avoidance, mm -hmm. the, the idea is to actually work on the PCCP area and conserve that because larger swaths of land create a better habitat in terms of its, its mitigation and also its maintenance. So that's why the focus is on these areas that were identified and approved by the federal agencies as having the highest habitat value. Now, could a project come in in Granite Bay and say, I want to preserve these five acres? Sure. But it would go through the process of determining is that really the best benefit or should they in fact participate with PCCP, which under our county code is really the preference. So it's not to say there isn't mitigation or avoidance potential on other projects, but that's the process of development versus how we've set up the PCCP program 
and how that operates in terms of the overall conservation strategy. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my District 4 does no longer stops at the Granite Bay boundary line now, as I said. It, it spans the entire southern portion below I-80 all the way up to and including a wedge of, of uh, Newcastle. But this also doesn't explain then why my predecessor had this committee. This is another committee that my predecessor had and that was taken away from me. So it, all of those arguments fail for me when my predecessor had this committee. Let me, uh, let me clarify. <clears throat> when uh, Supervisor Santucci, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> retired, the position was open <clears throat> and I was interested. But the issue with <clears throat> the PCCP was we had to convince the development community that this was in their best interest. And the only person that could do that, in my, <clears throat> in my opinion, was Supervisor um, Euler. Euler. <clears throat> and he was able <clears throat> to convince, <clears throat> excuse me, convince the development community <clears throat> that this was a good idea. And that's the only reason why. I wanted to be on there, but I knew it was a better part of wisdom for me to allow, <clears throat> allow Supervisor Euler to be on there. Yeah, sometimes we, sometimes we pay, play to the strengths of our colleagues right. just because they're the right person for the right task based on their skill set and yeah it wouldn't have happened without supervisor Wygand and probably supervisor Euler right yeah well, it would have happened would have been a lot more <laughs> okay. oh, well, more than I'll, 18 years yes. well then I'll <clears throat> just interject one other since you brought up skill sets you know I I'm also an attorney so I do have a skill set that not many other people possess Chairman yeah. Holmes, uh, if there are future, if there's any more questions that come up, Greg McKenzie is on Zoom. He texted me and let me know if there's any other technical questions he's happy to answer. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I think for the time being, we'll move to the next one. Yes, that's true. Okay, so South Plaza Regional Transportation Authority, Sparta. Um, there's a District 3 primary, District 4 alternate, and it was ranked one by both Di District 3 and District 4 looking for direction regarding the primary and the alternate on this position. Okay, I'll speak on Sparta. Um, the reason I, I believe it's in my best interest to serve on Sparta right now, I've been serving on the Placer County Transportation Planning Agency now for, for two years with, with you, um, Chair Holmes, and um, this last fall, there was a group that went from Sparta, I think, I believe it was Sparta and SACOG, that was taken to uh, Salt Lake City, I believe, to, to visit uh, their transit system. And because I do not serve on either SACOG or Sparta, I was not included in that. So it just doesn't seem, it doesn't seem like a good fit that I'm on PCTPA, and yet I am not privy to enjoying any other visits to any other cities to, to view their transit when I'm asked to make decisions on PCTPA with things I'm not privy to, whereas Sparta and SACOG members both were taken um, on that tour. So Supervisor Jones, you'll be the chair of PCTPA next year, and I think it would be appropriate to be the, you to be the representative for Sparta, because the meetings are con concurrent, they're right at the same day. Generally, the Sparta meetings are five minutes at the most, unless there's a controversy. And many times there are no items on the, on the and I'm still continue to be on the PCTPA, but I, I have no objection to you taking over the Sparta position, because I'm not going to Salt Lake City. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, and then Tribal County Advisory Committee. So, so currently this is a District 2 primary district five is the primary and it was ranked number one by districts two three and four um, district five did rank it as number two so there's been a bit of back and forth on this one and there was some questions about requirements of service so going back to the creation of this one in 04 it has always been held by the district two mm -hmm. and the district five supervisors and then there was the LCBC um, 
which does require the district two supervisor and the chair to serve currently there's no money in that so we aren't making appointments to right. that one as as of right now um i don't believe that this committee has been meeting i i, I don't believe it's very active at this time um so it's it's not a large commitment uh but looking for direction for service on that and I had a, a quick question or comment on this, Chair, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. On, uh, on this, I was, um, I've been on it. We have yet to meet uh, mm -hmm. since I've been on it. My understanding is that um, many of the tribal lands are in District 5 that are represented, but I'm, that's why I ranked it lower. We haven't met, and I am happy to defer to my colleagues uh, for membership on this committee. So you can all twist arms on it. And I would prefer, since I'm the chair this year, I would prefer, and I think in the past, it was always District 2 and the chair of the board. That's not no, the one, right? this one, yeah, when we went back and did the history, because that was a question that had come up. Okay. When we went back and looked at the history and in speaking with council, um, it has actually always been for this one, District 2 and the District 5 supervisor. And, and the thought process was the where the location of the tribe land is and the casino. Yeah. Um, LCPC is the one that does require the chair. Oh, okay. That is the one that does require it be the District 2 supervisor and the current chair of the board. So, so. Uh, in speaking with council, the other thing is that this, this committee initially was established during the build of the casino and it was really a, you know, like trying to get everybody, the relationships made. You know, we didn't have the relationships at that time and that was, was what they were, and since everything has been going smoothly, the casino has been, you know, the issues are not there, the problems that people thought we would have initially throughout the build out. So they have not been meeting. Um, that doesn't mean that as growth continues that these couldn't, you know, come back up and, ha and start having meetings again. Well, I, I'm certainly comfortable um, with my current relationships mm -hmm. with um, the tribes and I'm, so I don't need to serve on the committee if others are passionate about this committee. Uh, but happy to serve if no one is. But it looks like there's plenty. <laughs> yeah, I'd be glad to serve on that. Uh, any other? Supervisor yeah, Jones. Yeah, I'll make comments. I mean, right now we're basically asking the, uh, um, the tribe to partner with us on other projects, infrastructure pro projects and, and the like, that um, are pretty much countywide. So I... I think, I mean, I understand they're located in District 2, but I don't see, I think I see the need to, to limit it to just District 2 to, to be on that committee. And so uh, I would love to serve on that committee. Yeah. So it is, it is a two member from the, from the board, it is a two <coughs> member. And the, the District 2 um, representation was something that was determined sure. in governance as you know, we made it district centric to District 2. We can always re, you know, I mean, I will say from what I'm hearing today, I do believe that I need to come back and reevaluate the district centric committees. I think that's something that I've heard this board say, so I'm happy to do that. You know, we can look at that in, in the next governance workshop and make sure that we're, we're on the right track there. But that was where that one came from. Uh, I would say I would like to serve on that. Obviously, I ranked it as number one, but if it's really important to you, Suzanne, I'm happy to give that one up and maybe with the intention that depending on whether you meet this year or not, if you happen to meet and you're open to rotating next year, I'd like to come back on to that one, but I'm happy to give that one up if you'd like it. Wasn't a condition that a district two supervisor would be? Not a condition. Oh. So there's, there's nothing in the MOU that has any requirement of service on this. Um, the board had said district centric but that does not mean that it must be the district two supervisor. So there's no, no requirement of, of district two serving on okay. it. And we can absolutely make the change if that is the board's direction. Okay. So district District three, three and, and district four. four is what I am hearing for this. Okay, so we've, we've gotten through all of them. There's still direction that I need, though. So um, we will kind of go back through and look at this. 
So criminal justice policy committee, um, we're not gonna have any changes to that. That one is gonna remain the same and staff will look at rotations occurring on that if it's possible. Um, Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council. Uh, I, I've heard both supervisors wishing to serve as primary and just wanting to hear direction on the board's desire to ha who to have represent them. Any direction? <laughs> I'd like to continue serving on it. So the supervisor Jones. Uh, so uh, <coughs> supervisor Go, you said that. Uh, you're on a committee or you've been appointed to part of that? Uh, that was State College. That's yeah, that's, that's State the next oh, one. Okay. Yeah. And just with the Rose, oh, excuse me, microphone. Just with the Roseville business contacts, okay. um, right? I've been able to quickly secure meetings um, because of the folks that I know there, which I think is extremely helpful. And, right. you know, I, I appreciate Supervisor Jones's comments about, you know, having the economic development, but I think economic development is throughout the county, no matter where we're at. Yeah. Um, and so just as I think any of us could represent economic development, because um, we've got all of it in our throughout our county. Well, that's true, but this is the Greater Sacramento Area Economic Council, not the Roseville Economic Council. It is Greater Sacramento. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I, I was, I know, like I said, this was one that my predecessor had, and I was wondering on the SACOG committee, who had that before you were elected? Uh, Supervisor uh, Duran, I believe. Yeah, Supervisor Duran. I think, <coughs> I think what's interesting is that just because our predecessor had something, uh, you know, my, my predecessor didn't have, I think, CSAC, or maybe he did. I know you gave up a couple of yeah, items. Right. Um, committees for me, Supervisor Holmes, yeah. that I was interested in. But I think that um, just because our predecessor did it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to. I think I'm the right person um, to serve on that board as well as SACOG based on my experience yeah. the last couple of years as well as SACOG the last four years. And I feel like I still have work that I want to continue doing um, in both of those organizations. And I've had two years with GSEC, I'd like to continue um, longer as well as with SACOG? Well, it followed um, in the last two election cycles that both you and Supervisor Gustafson took over the committees that your predecessors had. I know I, I did the no, homework on it. I'm, I'm going to disagree. I did not. I did not. Um, Supervisor Montgomery served on Pioneer Energy, I believe. Mm -hmm. She did not serve on TRPA, CTC, or um, uh, Tahoe Transportation District and so there were quite a few changes that came when I came right. on so I did not take over um, the existing committees but you know what I find compelling uh, Supervisor Jones is so much of uh, GSEC's focus is on pretty significant development that is in our Sunset West area and, and to me that really does lend itself to Supervisor Gore continuing on that right now so that's a compelling argument to me, um, uh, and and but I hear your desire as well, and you've heard my desire. There's some committees I'd like to be on, um, and so I, you know, I would tend to support uh, Supervisor Gore staying on those two committees at this point and honoring your request, looking forward um, to changing because I do think there's times that. We all want to participate. We serve in these roles to serve our public and to further the interests of our community and our constituents. And um, I, 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 this is a really difficult conversation for the rest of us to sit and go and, and make judgment on that. But I would support, um, for now, this year, Supervisor Gore continuing in both of those. And I concur. Okay, well, just one last argument is the argument could be made that's the reason why we ran for office is to support our constituents right. and our communities and so without being given an opportunity i i have the least amount of committees and i've given up two so there there is no give and take here except i have to admit uh the chair did give um and shanti did but you know um this has been it for the last two years this is the first i've had two committees change so 
we all need to be given an opportunity. And I understand, you know, my predecessor may have hung on to that committee for, for 16 years or whatever, but that's still not a reason to not let me serve on it. I understand you're good. You have a lot to offer. The same goes for me as well. But the word has been said, so that's settled. Okay, so this brings us to SACOG. So, I mean, I, I think the word was just said about that. I was going to say, I, I just want to make sure the clarification is clear that we're going to remain the same on both of those. County Audit Committee, District 2 will be stepping in on this one. Is that correct? <laughs> Okay, and Golden Sierra Job Training Agency Governing Board. So this is, again, this is one that Supervisor Jones has asked to come off of. Um, and uh, let me get this PowerPoint to the same page we're at here. Um, so looking for a primary to serve on this. How often do they meet? Which one, the audit? No, no. this is Golden Sierra Golden Job Sierra. Training Agency yeah. Governing Board. And I expressed a willingness to take it if no one else wants it. I'm happy to do it. And I could do that as well if you don't want to um, serve on that name. It's just a monthly exam. meeting and it's not a very long one. Um, Go ahead. I mean, I'm, I'm happy no, to because you've got others. And <laughs> unless you want to continue serving on Instagram, Jones. No, thank you. I'm, I pulled in a couple of new ones. So. Okay. So on that one. Sure. Supervisor Gore. Um, homeless Task Force will be remaining the same, and we will look at that again next year. Mm -hmm. And then it sounds as if LAFCO will be remaining the same, except for Supervisor Shanti Landon coming in for. Um, Placer Count. Whoa. So, PCA Board. Still need some direction here. So I am, I feel really bad, Suzanne, because I <laughs> don't feel, I'm really I sorry. I, I just, I, the only reason, well, not the only reason, but a big part of the reason why I would like Bonnie to serve on there is just because the PCA is so new and the technical details are so overwhelming. Not that you're not capable. I know you're super <laughs> sharp and you can learn. I know that you can, um, but when when i was looking at all of these committee assignments i thought my perspective should be like what is the best thing for placer county not what's the best thing for me or what is the best thing for like what is it what committee do i want it really should be like what is the best and just with the newness of that committee and um, bonnie's understanding and having her knowledge that she has right now um that would be my my vote i'm sorry suzanne that's okay Okay. So we're okay. Okay. And then so on South Plaza Regional Transportation Authority, District 4 is moving into the primary. District 3 will take the alternate slot. And Tribal County Advisory Committee, this will now be uh, District 3 and District 4. Mm -hmm. We've already gone over the staff appointments. So I, I feel I have my direction. There is one thing that I wanted to bring up to the board that. Um, We've had this in place since 2011, and I just think it's a good reminder to get because uh, it doesn't come up often, but we do have a resolution in place that we adopted in 2011 that does allow where alternates are not designated, but the bylaws don't um, eliminate an alternate. The CEO does have the ability to put an alternate in place um, for any of you that are unable to attend. This very rarely comes up, but it has happened, and I just wanted you all to be aware of that, that if you are wanting to serve on a committee and you're unable to go to attend it for some odd reason, and this would be a way, say, with like Homelessness Task Force. If that's the kind of committee, it would not qualify for something like CSAC, you know, where they have bylaws that would not allow us to just simply select somebody. But I wanted to just make that open to you so that if there is some a time where you're unable to attend, please reach out to me and we can determine if this resolution would be something that we could implement during that time and you know, get an alternate selected so that Placer County is always represented. Yes. Okay, Supervisor. Yes. I had one um, 
for the staff alternates on the Tahoe Conservancy, the TRPA, and Tahoe Transportation District, do you mind sending them an official letter, each of those agencies? Because apparently TRPA did not know. Oh, okay. Um, and there's an upcoming meeting where I may have to leave early to get to an event down here from TRPA, and I want to make sure they're okay if Stephanie needs to vote on something. Absolutely. So all of the... All of the boards and commissions will receive official letters, including them on the alternate slots. So we will ensure that okay. that happens to, to notify them of the direction that's given. Again, today was simply direction, so these do have to come back for finalization on January 24th, which we will do in our standard process of placing on consent. Okay, thank you very much, because I do, uh, I did ask recently, and TRPA said, no, Larry Sevison, and I said, I don't think so, so I'm, I'm glad. And, and I can get them, is the meeting prior to the 24th? Uh, I believe, no, it's the 25th. Okay, we, we will make sure that they have okay. that. May I ask yes. a question about yeah. that? Um, so when you're an alternate, mm -hmm. you get to do the wonderful Form 700, even if yes. you never attend a meeting. So, for example, South Placer Wastewater Authority, which they only meet, I, I think we meet two, maybe three times a year, um, I'm going to miss the January meeting. Mm -hmm. Right. There is not an alternate. Um, let's see. You will be serving on the wastewater authority board, Supervisor Landon, but I can't attend. But that, that one does not have an alternate. Mm -hmm. um, but does that mean that if somebody else came on my behalf for one time, they'd have to fill out the 700 form? It does mean that. That is the challenge to this, and that is what you know. This resolution is. It's very beneficial in certain areas, and it was established so that when we had conflicts, but there were, you know, important matters in front of these other boards. We wanted to make sure that we were always represented. So it would require that. Obviously, as staff, we're happy to help any of the board members if they want to attend, and we can we can make that happen with the Form 700. It's, you know, it, it isn't that difficult, especially if it would mean that Placer County partakes in an important vote. Yeah. Well, and otherwise, you can just, like, for SPWA, um, I could just, I make, I'm making sure there's a quorum because I would hate to ask somebody then to do another darn quorum. Yes. For only, you know, one meeting of a year, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Okay, that's um, helpful to know. Thank you. All right. Supervisor <coughs> Jones, did you have another comment? Oh, no, sorry. <coughs> just. All right. Okay, are we? You are good. Thank you very much, board. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Now we'll return. I'm so sorry. We do have to call for public comment. Oh, yes, public comment. Is there any public comment on this item? Do you see any more? I see. No. All right. Great. Okay, thank you. So now we'll go back into closed session, correct? The board will now uh, adjourn to closed session, consider three potential cases under anticipated litigation, and conference with labor negotiators. Can give your comments yeah hi um yeah just um um watching how you guys were all talking about these different positions and trying to uh make decisions on our behalf i really appreciate that um that you're trying to put the people and the concerns of the county before you know your own personal preferences i i really appreciate that um even though it's so hard to do because you have so much talent there <laughs> um i i could hear um suzanne jones really wanting to do something in um in some of those committees and even though she was deferred i'm just hoping that um the minute somehow um uh, capture um, the opportunity that she will probably have, hopefully, uh, next year or the next time you guys uh, come up um, in making this decision making for those two, uh, I think it was two committees that she was really wanting to participate in. So um, even though she may not be able to do it now, um, that somehow in the minutes it's captured that it will be rotated next next term. Thank you. Chair, I see no further. 
and may I, I, you know, I was just thinking about something, and maybe this is, may I interrupt, sorry. Go, go right um, Supervisor Jones, you know, I'm gonna be on the Mega Region Committee Chair um, this next year, but um, because I've had an opportunity to do SACOG now it's like three years, or however many years, this week, no, I guess this will be my fifth year. If you'd like to do it next year, I'm happy to give SACOG to you next year. I'd like to finish out this portion, but if you'd like to do SACOG next year, I'm happy to give you that opportunity. Thank you. Okay. Is there any more public comment? We are no more. Okay. <laughs> now. <laughs> so for the record, we are adjourning to closed session to consider three items of potential litigation uh, and one item of labor negotiations. Okay.
board has just returned from closed session and we'll ask county council to report out. Nope. The board again met in closed session to consider the following. Under anticipated litigation, initiation of litigation, the board heard a report and provided direction. On the first potential case under uh, potential exposure to litigation, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 5-0 vote on both of those. On the second potential case, the board heard a report and provided direction on a 4-1 vote. The board then conducted conference with labor negotiators. A report, a report was provided. No action was requested or taken. That concludes the report out of closed session.